Blackstone Audio presents God in the Dock, Part Two. One, dangers of national repentance. The idea of national repentance seems, at first sight, to provide such an edifying contrast to that national self-righteousness of which England is so often accused, and with which she entered, or is said to have entered, the last war, that a Christian naturally turns to it with hope. Young Christians, especially last-year undergraduates and first-year curates, are turning to it in large numbers. They are ready to believe that England bears part of the guilt for the present war, and ready to admit their own share in the guilt of England. What that share is, I do not find it easy to determine. Most of these young men were children, and none of them had a vote or the experience which would enable them to use a vote wisely when England made many of those decisions to which the present disorders could plausibly be traced. Are they perhaps repenting what they have in no sense done? If they are, it might be supposed that their error is very harmless. Men fail so often to repent their real sins that the occasional repentance of an imaginary sin might appear almost desirable. But what actually happens, I have watched it happening to the useful national penitent, is a little more complicated than that. England is not a natural agent, but a civil society. When we speak of England's actions, we mean the actions of the British government. The young man who is called upon to repent of England's foreign policy is really being called upon to repent the acts of his neighbour. For a foreign secretary or a cabinet minister is certainly a neighbour. And repentance presupposes condemnation. The first and fatal charm of national repentance is, therefore, the encouragement it gives us to turn from the bitter task of repenting our own sins to the congenial one of bewailing, but first of denouncing the conduct of others. If it were clear to the young that this is what he is doing, no doubt he would remember the law of charity. Unfortunately, the very terms in which national repentance is recommended to him conceal its true nature. By a dangerous figure of speech, he calls the government not they, but we. And since, as penitents, we are not encouraged to be charitable about our own sins, nor to give ourselves the benefit of any doubt, a government which is called we is ipso facto placed beyond the sphere of charity or even of justice. You can say anything you please about it. You can indulge in the popular vice of detraction without restraint, and yet feel all the time that you are practicing contrition. A group of such young penitents will say, "Let us repent our national sins." What they mean is, "Let us attribute to our neighbour, even our Christian neighbour in the cabinet, whenever we disagree with him, every abominable motive that Satan can suggest to our fancy." Such an escape from personal repentance into that tempting region, where passions have the privilege to work and never hear the sound of their own names, would be welcome to the moral cowardice of anyone. But it is doubly attractive to the young intellectual. When a man over forty tries to repent the sins of England and to love her enemies, he is attempting something costly, for he was brought up to certain patriotic sentiments which cannot be mortified without a struggle. But an educated man who is now in his twenties usually has no such sentiment to mortify. In art, in literature, in politics, he has been ever since he can remember one of an angry and restless minority. He has drunk in almost with his mother's milk a distrust of English statesmen and a contempt for the manners, pleasures, and enthusiasms of his less educated fellow countrymen. All Christians know that they must forgive their enemies, but. My enemy primarily means the man whom I am really tempted to hate and traduce. If you listen to young Christian intellectuals talking, you will soon find out who their real enemy is. He seems to have two names: Colonel Blimp and the Businessman. I suspect that the latter usually means the speaker's father, but that is speculation. What is certain is that in asking such people to forgive the Germans and Russians and to open their eyes to the sins of England, you are asking them not to mortify but to indulge their ruling passion. I do not mean that what you are asking them is not right and necessary in itself. We must forgive all our enemies or be damned. But it is emphatically not the exhortation which your audience needs. The communal sins which they should be told to repent are those of their own age and class. Its contempt for the uneducated, its readiness to suspect evil, 
its self-righteous provocations of public obloquy, its breaches of the fifth commandment. Of these sins I have heard nothing among them. Till I do, I must think their candor towards the national enemy a rather inexpensive virtue. If a man cannot forgive the Colonel Blimp next door, whom he has seen, how shall he forgive the dictators whom he has not seen? Is it not, then, the duty of the Church to preach national repentance? I think it is. But the office, like many others, can be profitably discharged only by those who discharge it with reluctance. We know that a man may have to hate his mother for the Lord's sake. The sight of a Christian rebuking his mother, though tragic, may be edifying. But only if we are quite sure that he has been a good son, and that, in his rebuke, spiritual zeal is triumphing, not without agony, over strong natural affection. The moment there is reason to suspect that he enjoys rebuking her, that he believes himself to be rising above the natural level, while he is still, in reality, groveling below it in the unnatural, the spectacle becomes merely disgusting. The hard sayings of our Lord are wholesome only to those who find them hard. There is a terrible chapter in François Mauriac's Vie de Jésus. When the Lord spoke of brother and child against parent, the other disciples were horrified. Not so Judas. He took to it as a duck takes to water. Pourquoi cette stupeur? se demande Judas. Il aime dans le Christ cette vie simple, ce regard de Dieu sur l'horreur humaine. Why this stupefaction? asked Judas. He loved in Christ his simple view of things, his divine glance at human depravity. For there are two states of mind which face the dominical paradoxes without flinching. God guard us from one of them. 2. Who weighs with the self? Self-renunciation is thought to be, and indeed is, very near the core of Christian ethics. When Aristotle writes in praise of a certain kind of self-love, we may feel, despite the careful distinction which he draws between the legitimate and the illegitimate philosia, that here we strike something essentially sub-Christian. It is more difficult, however, to decide what we think of St. François de Sales's chapter De la douceur envers nous-mêmes, of meekness towards ourselves, where we are forbidden to indulge resentment even against ourselves, and advised to reprove even our own faults avec des remonstrances douces et tranquilles, with mild and calm remonstrances, feeling more compassion than passion. In the same spirit, Lady Julian of Norwich would have us loving and peaceable, not only to our even Christians, but to ourself. Even the New Testament bids me love my neighbor as myself which would be a horrible command if the self were simply to be hated. Yet our Lord also says that a true disciple must hate his own life. We must not explain this apparent contradiction by saying that self-love is right up to a certain point and wrong beyond that point. The question is not one of degree. There are two kinds of self-hatred which look rather alike in their earlier stages, but of which one is wrong from the beginning and the other right to the end. When Shelley speaks of self-contempt as the source of cruelty, or when a later poet says that he has no stomach for the man who loathes his neighbor as himself, they are referring to a very real and very unchristian hatred of the self, which may make diabolical a man whom common selfishness would have left, at least for a while, merely animal. The hard-boiled economist or psychologist of our own day, recognizing the ideological taint or Freudian motive in his own makeup, does not necessarily learn Christian humility. He may end in what is called a low view of all souls, including his own, which expresses itself in cynicism or cruelty or both. Even Christians, if they accept in certain forms the doctrine of total depravity, are not always free from the danger. The logical conclusion of the process is the worship of suffering, for others as well as for the self, which we see, if I read it aright, in Mr. David Lindsay's Voyage to Arcturus, or that extraordinary vacancy which Shakespeare depicts at the end of Richard III. Richard, in his agony, tries to turn to self-love, but he has been seeing through all emotions so long that he sees through even this. It becomes a mere tautology. Richard loves Richard, that is, I am I. Now, the self can be regarded in two ways. 
On the one hand, it is God's creature, an occasion of love and rejoicing, now indeed hateful in condition, but to be pitied and healed. On the other hand, it is that one self of all others which is called I and me, and which on that ground puts forward an irrational claim to preference. This claim is to be not only hated, but simply killed, never, as George MacDonald says, to be allowed a moment's respite from eternal death. The Christian must wage endless war against the clamor of the ego as ego, but he loves and approves selves as such, though not their sins. The very self-love which he has to reject is to him a specimen of how he ought to feel to all selves, and he may hope that when he has truly learned, which will hardly be in this life, to love his neighbor as himself, he may then be able to love himself as his neighbor, that is, with charity instead of partiality. The other kind of self-hatred, on the contrary, hates selves as such. It begins by accepting the special value of the particular self called me, then, wounded in its pride to find that such a darling object should be so disappointing, it seeks revenge, first upon that self, then on all. Deeply egoistic, but now with an inverted egoism, it uses the revealing argument, I don't spare myself, with the implication, then, a fortiori, I need not spare others, and becomes like the centurion in Tacitus, imitio quia tolevererat more relentless because he had endured it himself. The wrong asceticism torments the self. The right kind kills the selfness. We must die daily. But it is better to love the self than to love nothing, and to pity the self than to pity no one. 3. Meditation on the Third Commandment from many letters to the Guardian, and from much that is printed elsewhere, we learn of the growing desire for a Christian party, a Christian front, or a Christian platform in politics. Nothing is so earnestly to be wished as a real assault by Christianity on the politics of the world. Nothing, at first sight, so fitted to deliver this assault as a Christian party. But it is odd that certain difficulties in this program should be already neglected while the printer's ink is hardly dry on Jacques Maritain's scholasticism and politics. The Christian party must either confine itself to stating what ends are desirable and what means are lawful, or else it must go further and select from among the lawful means those which it deems possible and efficacious and give to these its practical support. If it chooses the first alternative, it will not be a political party. Nearly all parties agree in professing ends which we admit to be desirable, security, a living wage, and the best adjustment between the claims of order and freedom. What distinguishes one party from another is the championship of means. We do not dispute whether the citizens are to be made happy, but whether an egalitarian or a hierarchical state, whether capitalism or socialism, whether despotism or democracy is most likely to make them so. What, then, will the Christian party actually do? Philarchus, a devout Christian, is convinced that temporal welfare can flow only from a Christian life, and that a Christian life can be promoted in the community only by an authoritarian state which has swept away the last vestiges of the hated liberal infection. He thinks fascism not so much an evil as a good thing perverted regards democracy as a monster whose victory would be a defeat for Christianity, and is tempted to accept even fascist assistance, hoping that he and his friends will prove the leaven in a lump of British fascists. Stativus is equally devout and equally Christian. Deeply conscious of the fall, and therefore convinced that no human creature can be trusted with more than the minimum power over his fellows, and anxious to preserve the claims of God from any infringement by those of Caesar, he still sees in democracy the only hope of Christian freedom. He is tempted to accept aid from champions of the status quo, whose commercial or imperial motives bear hardly even a veneer of theism. Finally, we have Spartacus, also a Christian and also sincere, full of the prophetic and dominical denunciations of riches, and certain that the historical Jesus, long betrayed by the apostles, the fathers and the churches, demands of us a left revolution and he also is tempted to accept help from unbelievers who profess themselves quite openly to be the enemies of God. The three types represented by these three Christians presumably come together to form a Christian party, 
either a deadlock ensues, and there the history of the Christian party ends, or else one of the three succeeds in floating a party and driving the other two, with their followers, out of its ranks. The new party, being probably a minority of the Christians, who are themselves a minority of the citizens, will be too small to be effective. In practice, it will have to attach itself to the un-Christian party nearest to it in beliefs about means, to the fascists, if Philarchus has one, to the conservatives, if Stativus, to the communists, if Spartacus. It remains to ask how the resulting situation will differ from that in which Christians find themselves today. It is not reasonable to suppose that such a Christian party will acquire new powers of leavening the infidel organization to which it is attached. Why should it? Whatever it calls itself, it will represent not Christendom, but a part of Christendom. The principle which divides it from its brethren and unites it to its political allies will not be theological. It will have no authority to speak for Christianity. It will have no more power than the political skill of its members gives it to control the behavior of its unbelieving allies. But there will be a real and most disastrous novelty. It will not simply be a part of Christendom, but a part claiming to be the whole. By the mere act of calling itself the Christian party, it implicitly accuses all Christians who do not join it of apostasy and betrayal. It will be exposed in an aggravated degree to that temptation which the devil spares none of us at any time, the temptation of claiming for our favorite opinions that kind and degree of certainty and authority which really belongs only to our faith. The danger of mistaking our merely natural, though perhaps legitimate, enthusiasms for holy zeal is always great. Can any more fatal expedient be devised for increasing it than that of dubbing a small band of fascists, communists, or democrats the Christian party? The demon inherent in every party is at all times ready enough to disguise himself as the Holy Ghost. The formation of a Christian party means handing over to him the most efficient make-up we can find. And when once the disguise has succeeded, his commands will presently be taken to abrogate all moral laws and to justify whatever the unbelieving allies of the Christian party wish to do. If ever Christian men can be brought to think treachery and murder the lawful means of establishing the regime they desire, and faked trials, religious persecution, and organized hooliganism the lawful means of maintaining it, it will, surely, be by just such a process as this. The history of the late medieval pseudo-crusader, of the covenanters, of the orange men, should be remembered. On those who add, thus said the Lord, to their merely human utterances, descends the doom of a conscience which seems clearer and clearer the more it is loaded with sin. All this comes from pretending that God has spoken when he has not spoken. He will not settle the two brothers' inheritance. Who made me a judge or a divider over you? Luke 12, verse 14. By the natural light, he has shown us what means are lawful. To find out which one is efficacious, he has given us brains. The rest he has left to us. Monsieur Maritain has hinted at the only way in which Christianity, as opposed to schismatics blasphemously claiming to represent it, can influence politics. Nonconformity has influenced modern English history, not because there was a nonconformist party, but because there was a nonconformist conscience which all parties had to take into account. An interdenominational Christian voter society might draw up a list of assurances about ends and means which every member was expected to exact from any political party as the price of his support. Such a society might claim to represent Christendom far more truly than any Christian front. And for that reason, I should be prepared, in principle, for membership and obedience to be obligatory on Christians. So it all comes down to pestering MPs with letters? Yes, just that. I think such pestering combines the dove and the serpent. I think it means a world where parties have to take care not to alienate Christians, instead of a world where Christians have to be loyal to infidel parties. Finally, I think a minority can influence politics only by pestering or by becoming a party in the new continental sense, that is, a secret society of murderers and blackmailers, which is impossible to Christians. But I had forgotten. There is a third way, by becoming a majority. He who converts his neighbor has performed the most practical Christian political act of all. 
4. On the Reading of Old Books There is a strange idea abroad that in every subject the ancient books should be read only by the professionals, and that the amateur should content himself with the modern books. Thus I have found, as a tutor in English literature, that if the average student wants to find out something about Platonism, the very last thing he thinks of doing is to take a translation of Plato off the library shelf and read the symposium. He would rather read some dreary modern book ten times as long, all about isms and influences, and only once in twelve pages telling him what Plato actually said. The error is rather an amiable one, for it springs from humility. The student is half afraid to meet one of the great philosophers face to face. He feels himself inadequate, and thinks he will not understand him. But if he only knew, the great man, just because of his greatness, is much more intelligible than his modern commentator. The simplest student will be able to understand, if not all, yet a very great deal of what Plato said. But hardly anyone can understand some modern books on Platonism. It has always therefore been one of my main endeavours as a teacher to persuade the young that first-hand knowledge is not only more worth acquiring than second-hand knowledge, but is usually much easier and more delightful to acquire. This mistaken preference for the modern books and this shyness of the old ones is nowhere more rampant than in theology. Wherever you find a little study circle of Christian laity, you can be almost certain that they are studying not St. Luke or St. Paul or St. Augustine or Thomas Aquinas or Richard Hooker or Joseph Butler, but Nicholas Berdyaev or Jacques Maritain or Reinhold Niebuhr or Dorothy L. Sayers or even myself. Now this seems to me topsy-turvy. Naturally, since I myself am a writer, I do not wish the ordinary reader to read no modern books. But if he must read only the new or only the old, I would advise him to read the old. And I would give him this advice, precisely because he is an amateur and therefore much less protected than the expert against the dangers of an exclusive contemporary diet. A new book is still on its trial, and the amateur is not in a position to judge it. It has to be tested against the great body of Christian thought down the ages, and all its hidden implications often unsuspected by the author himself, have to be brought to light. Often it cannot be fully understood without the knowledge of a good many other modern books. If you join at eleven o'clock a conversation which began at eight, you will often not see the real bearing of what is said. Remarks which seem to you very ordinary will produce laughter or irritation, and you will not see why. The reason, of course, being that the earlier stages of the conversation have given them a special point. In the same way, sentences in a modern book which look quite ordinary may be directed at some other book. In this way you may be led to accept what you would have indignantly rejected if you knew its real significance. The only safety is to have a standard of plain, central Christianity, mere Christianity, as Baxter called it, which puts the controversies of the moment in their proper perspective. Such a standard can be acquired only from the old books. It is a good rule, after reading a new book, never to allow yourself another new one till you have read an old one in between. If that is too much for you, you should at least read one old one to every three new ones. Every age has its own outlook. It is specially good at seeing certain truths, and specially liable to make certain mistakes. We all, therefore, need the books that will correct the characteristic mistakes of our own period. And that means the old books. All contemporary writers share, to some extent, the contemporary outlook, even those, like myself, who seem most opposed to it. Nothing strikes me more when I read the controversies of past ages than the fact that both sides were usually assuming, without question, a good deal which we should now absolutely deny. They thought that they were as completely opposed as two sides could be, but in fact they were all the time secretly united united with each other and against earlier and later ages, by a great mass of common assumptions. We may be sure that the characteristic blindness of the twentieth century, the blindness about which posterity will ask, but how could they have thought that, lies where we have never suspected it, and concerns something about which there is untroubled agreement between Hitler and President Roosevelt, or between Mr. H. G. Wells and Karl Barth. None of us can fully escape this blindness but we shall certainly increase it and weaken our guard against it if we read only modern books. Where they are true, they will give us truths, which we half knew already. 
Where they are false, they will aggravate the error with which we are already dangerously ill. The only palliative is to keep the clean sea breeze of the centuries blowing through our minds, and this can be done only by reading old books. Not, of course, that there is any magic about the past. People were no cleverer then than they are now. They made as many mistakes as we, but not the same mistakes. They will not flatter us in the errors we are already committing, and their own errors, being now open and palpable, will not endanger us. Two heads are better than one, not because either is infallible, but because they are unlikely to go wrong in the same direction. To be sure, the books of the future would be just as good a corrective as the books of the past, but unfortunately we cannot get at them. I myself was first led into reading the Christian classics almost accidentally, as a result of my English studies. Some, such as Richard Hooker, George Herbert, Thomas Traherne, Jeremy Taylor and John Bunyan, I read because they are themselves great English writers. Others, such as Boethius, St. Augustine, Thomas Aquinas and Dante, because they were influences. George MacDonald I had found for myself at the age of sixteen and never wavered in my allegiance, though I tried for a long time to ignore his Christianity. They are, you will note, a mixed bag, representative of many churches, climates and ages. And that brings me to yet another reason for reading them. The divisions of Christendom are undeniable, and are by some of these writers most fiercely expressed. But if any man is tempted to think, as one might be tempted who read only contemporaries, that Christianity is a word of so many meanings that it means nothing at all, he can learn beyond all doubt, by stepping out of his own century, that this is not so. Measured against the ages, mere Christianity turns out to be no insipid interdenominational transparency, but something positive, self-consistent, and inexhaustible. I know it indeed to my cost. In the days when I still hated Christianity, I learned to recognize, like some all-too-familiar smell, that almost unvarying something which met me, now in Puritan Bunyan, now in Anglican Hooker, now in Thomas Dante. It was there, honeyed and floral, in François de Sales. It was there, grave and homely, in Edmund Spencer and Isaac Walton. It was there, grim but manful, in Blaise Pascal and Dr. Samuel Johnson. There again, with a mild, frightening, paradisial flavor, in Henry Vaughan and Jacob Burma and Traherne. In the urban sobriety of the eighteenth century, one was not safe. Law and Butler were two lions in the path. The supposed paganism of the Elizabethans could not keep it out. It lay in wait where a man might have supposed himself safest, in the very center of the fairy queen and the Arcadia. It was, of course, varied, and yet, after all, so unmistakably the same. Recognizable, not to be evaded, the odor which is death to us until we allow it to become life. An air that kills from yon far country blows. We are all rightly distressed and ashamed also at the divisions of Christendom. But those who have always lived within the Christian fold may be too easily dispirited by them. They are bad, but such people do not know what it looks like from without. Seen from there, what is left intact, despite all the divisions, still appears, as it truly is, an immensely formidable unity. I know, for I saw it, and well our enemies know it. That unity any of us can find by going out of his own age. It is not enough, but it is more than you had thought till then. Once you are well soaked in it, if you then venture to speak, you will have an amusing experience. You will be thought a papist when you are actually reproducing Bunyan, a pantheist when you are quoting Aquinas, and so forth. For you have now got on to the great level viaduct which crosses the ages, and which looks so high from the valleys, so low from the mountains, so narrow compared with the swamps, and so broad compared with the sheep tracks. The present book, St. Athanasius, the Incarnation of the Word of God, is something of an experiment. The translation is intended for the world at large, not only for theological students. If it succeeds, other translations of other great Christian books will presumably follow. In one sense, of course, it is not the first in the field. Translations of the Theologia Germanica, the Imitation, the Scale of Perfection, and the Revelations of Lady Julian of Norwich are already on the market and are very valuable, though some of them are not very scholarly. But it will be noticed that these are all books of devotion rather than of doctrine. 
Now the layman or amateur needs to be instructed as well as to be exhorted. In this age his need for knowledge is particularly pressing. Nor would I admit any sharp division between the two kinds of book. For my own part, I tend to find the doctrinal books often more helpful in devotion than the devotional books, and I rather suspect that the same experience may await many others. I believe that many who find that nothing happens when they sit down or kneel down to a book of devotion would find that the heart sings unbidden while they are working their way through a tough bit of theology with a pipe in their teeth and a pencil in their hand. This is a good translation of a very great book. St. Athanasius has suffered in popular estimation from a certain sentence in the Athanasian Creed. I will not labor the point that that work is not exactly a creed and was not by St. Athanasius, for I think it is a very fine piece of writing. The words, Which faith except every one do keep whole and undefiled, without doubt he shall perish everlastingly, are the offense. They are commonly misunderstood. The operative word is keep, not acquire or even believe, but keep. The author, in fact, is not talking about unbelievers, but about deserters. Not about those who have never heard of Christ, nor even those who have misunderstood and refused to accept Him, but of those who, having really understood and really believed, then allow themselves, under the sway of sloth or of fashion or of any other invited confusion, to be drawn away into sub-Christian modes of thought. They are a warning against the curious modern assumption that all changes of belief, however brought about, are necessarily exempt from blame. But this is not my immediate concern. I mention the creed, commonly called, of St. Athanasius, only to get out of the reader's way what may have been a bogey, and to put the true Athanasius in its place. His epitaph is Athanasius contra mundum, Athanasius against the world. We are proud that our country has more than once stood against the world. Athanasius did the same. He stood for the Trinitarian doctrine, whole and undefiled, when it looked as if all the civilized world was slipping back from Christianity into the religion of Arius, into one of those sensible, synthetic religions which are so strongly recommended today, and which, then, as now, included among their devotees many highly cultivated clergymen. It is his glory that he did not move with the times. It is his reward that he now remains when those times, as all times do, have moved away. When I first opened his De Incarnazione, I soon discovered by a very simple test that I was reading a masterpiece. I knew very little Christian Greek except that of the New Testament, and I had expected difficulties. To my astonishment, I found it almost as easy as Xenophon, and only a mastermind could, in the fourth century, have written so deeply on such a subject with such classical simplicity. Every page I read confirmed this impression. His approach to the miracles is badly needed today, for it is the final answer to those who object to them as arbitrary and meaningless violations of the laws of nature. They are here shown to be rather the retelling, in capital letters, of the same message which nature writes in her crabbed, cursive hand. The very operations one would expect of him who was so full of life that when he wished to die he had to borrow death from others. The whole book, indeed, is a picture of the tree of life, a sappy and golden book full of buoyancy and confidence. We cannot, I admit, appropriate all its confidence today. We cannot point to the high virtue of Christian living and the gay, almost mocking courage of Christian martyrdom as proof of our doctrines with quite that assurance which Athanasius takes as a matter of course. But whoever may be to blame for that, it is not Athanasius. The translator knows so much more Christian Greek than I that it would be out of place for me to praise her version. But it seems to me to be in the right tradition of English translation. I do not think the reader will find here any of that sawdust quality which is so common in modern renderings from the ancient languages. That is as much as the English reader will notice. Those who compare the version with the original will be able to estimate how much wit and talent is presupposed in such a choice, for example, as those wiseacres on the very first page. 5. Two Lectures And so, said the lecturer, I end where I began. Evolution, development, the slow struggle upwards and onwards from crude and inchoate beginnings towards ever-increasing perfection and elaboration. 
that appears to be the very formula of the whole universe. We see it exemplified in everything we study. The oak comes from the acorn. The giant express engine of today comes from the rocket. The highest achievements of contemporary art are in a continuous line of descent from the rude scratchings with which prehistoric man adorned the wall of his cave. What are the ethics and philosophy of civilized man but a miraculous elaboration of the most primitive instincts and savage taboos? Each one of us has grown through slow prenatal stages in which we were at first more like fish than mammals from a particle of matter too small to be seen. Man himself springs from beasts, the organic from the inorganic. Development is the key word. The march of all things is from lower to higher. None of this, of course, was new to me or to anyone else in the audience, but it was put very well, much better than it appears in my reproduction, and the whole voice and figure of the lecturer were impressive. At least they must have impressed me, for otherwise I cannot account for the curious dream I had that night. I dreamed that I was still at the lecture, and the voice from the platform was still going on. But it was saying all the wrong things. At least it may have been saying the right things up to the very moment at which I began attending, but it certainly began going wrong after that. What I remembered on waking went like this. Appears to be the very formula of the whole universe. We see it exemplified in everything we study. The acorn comes from a full-grown oak. The first crude engine, the rocket, comes not from a still cruder engine, but from something much more perfect than itself, and much more complex, the mind of a man, and a man of genius. The first prehistoric drawings come not from earlier scratchings, but from the hand and brain of human beings, whose hand and brain cannot be shown to have been in any way inferior to our own. And indeed, it is obvious that the man who first conceived the idea of making a picture must have been a greater genius than any of the artists who have succeeded him. The embryo with which the life of each one of us began did not originate from something even more embryonic. It originated from two fully developed human beings, our parents. Descent, downward movement, is the key word. The march of all things is from higher to lower. The rude and imperfect thing always springs from something perfect and developed. I did not think much of this while I was shaving, but it so happened that I had no ten o'clock pupil that morning, and when I had finished answering my letters, I sat down and reflected on my dream. It appeared to me that the dream lecturer had a good deal to be said for him. It is true that we do see all round us things growing up to perfection from small and rude beginnings. But then it is equally true that the small and rude beginnings themselves always come from some full-grown and developed thing. All adults were once babies, true, but then all babies were begotten and born by adults. Corn does come from seed, but then seed comes from corn. I could even give the dream lecturer an example he had missed. All civilizations grow from small beginnings— but when you look into it, you always find that those small beginnings themselves have been dropped, as an oak drops an acorn, by some other and mature civilization. The weapons and even the cookery of old Germanic barbarism are, so to speak, driftwood from the wrecked ship of Roman civilization. The starting point of Greek culture is the remains of older Minoan cultures, supplemented by oddments from civilized Egypt and Phoenicia. But in that case, thought I, what about the first civilization of all? As soon as I asked this question, I realized that the dream lecturer had been choosing his examples rather cautiously. He had talked only about things we can see going on around us. He had kept off the subject of absolute beginnings. He had quite correctly pointed out that in the present and in the historical past we see imperfect life coming from perfect just as much as vice versa. But he hadn't even attempted to answer the real lecturer about the beginnings of all life. The real lecturer's view was that when you got back far enough, back into those parts of the past which we know less about, you would find an absolute beginning, and it would be something small and imperfect. That was a point in favor of the real lecturer. He at least had a theory about the absolute beginning, whereas the dream lecturer had slurred it over. But hadn't the real lecturer done a little slurring, too? 
He had not given us a hint that his theory of the ultimate origins involved us in believing that nature's habits have, since those days, altered completely. Her present habits show us an endless cycle, the bird coming from the egg and the egg from the bird. But he asked us to believe that the whole thing started with an egg which had been preceded by no bird. Perhaps it did. But the whole prima facie plausibility of his view, the ease with which the audience accepted it as something natural and obvious, depended on his slurring over the immense difference between this and the processes we actually observe. He put it over by drawing our attention to the fact that eggs develop into birds and making us forget that birds lay eggs. Indeed, we have been trained to do this all our lives, trained to look at the universe with one eye shut. Developmentalism is made to look plausible by a kind of trick. For the first time in my life, I began to look at the question with both eyes open. In the world I know, the perfect produces the imperfect, which again becomes perfect. Egg leads to bird and bird to egg in endless succession. If ever there was a life which sprang of its own accord out of a purely inorganic universe, or a civilization which raised itself by its own shoulder straps out of pure savagery, then this event was totally unlike the beginnings of every subsequent life and every subsequent civilization. The thing may have happened, but all its plausibility is gone. On any view, the first beginning must have been outside the ordinary processes of nature. An egg which came from no bird is no more natural than a bird which had existed from all eternity. And since the egg-bird-egg sequence leads us to no plausible beginning, is it not reasonable to look for the real origin somewhere outside sequence altogether? You have to go outside the sequence of engines into the world of men to find the real originator of the rocket. Is it not equally reasonable to look outside nature for the real originator of the natural order? 6. Meditation in a Tool Shed I was standing today in the dark tool shed. The sun was shining outside, and through the crack at the top of the door there came a sunbeam. From where I stood, that beam of light, with the specks of dust floating in it, was the most striking thing in the place. Everything else was almost pitch black. I was seeing the beam, not seeing things by it. Then I moved, so that the beam fell on my eyes. Instantly the whole previous picture vanished. I saw no tool shed, and above all, no beam. Instead, I saw, framed in the irregular cranny at the top of the door, green leaves moving on the branches of a tree outside, and beyond that, ninety-odd million miles away, the sun. Looking along the beam and looking at the beam are very different experiences. But this is only a very simple example of the difference between looking at and looking along. A young man meets a girl. The whole world looks different when he sees her. Her voice reminds him of something he has been trying to remember all his life, and ten minutes' casual chat with her is more precious than all the favours that all other women in the world could grant. He is, as they say, in love. Now comes a scientist and describes this young man's experience from the outside. For him, it is all an affair of the young man's genes and a recognised biological stimulus. That is the difference between looking along the sexual impulse and looking at it. When you have got into the habit of making this distinction, you will find examples of it all day long. The mathematician sits thinking, and to him it seems that he is contemplating timeless and spaceless truths about quantity. But the cerebral physiologist, if he could look inside the mathematician's head, would find nothing timeless and spaceless there, only tiny movements in the grey matter. The savage dances in ecstasy at midnight before Nyonga and feels with every muscle that his dance is helping to bring the new green crops and the spring rain and the babies. The anthropologist, observing that savage, records that he is performing a fertility ritual of the type so-and-so. The girl cries over her broken doll and feels that she has lost a real friend. The psychologist says that her nascent maternal instinct has been temporarily lavished on a bit of shaped and coloured wax. As soon as you have grasped this simple distinction, it raises a question. You get one experience of a thing when you look along it, and another when you look at it. Which is the true or valid experience? Which tells you most about the thing? 
and you can hardly ask that question without noticing that for the last fifty years or so, everyone has been taking the answer for granted. It has been assumed, without discussion, that if you want the true account of religion, you must go not to religious people, but to anthropologists. That if you want the true account of sexual love, you must go not to lovers, but to psychologists. That if you want to understand some ideology, such as medieval chivalry or the nineteenth-century idea of a gentleman, you must listen not to those who lived inside it, but to sociologists. The people who look at things have had it all their own way. The people who look along things have simply been browbeaten. It has even come to be taken for granted that the external account of a thing somehow refutes or debunks the account given from inside. All these moral ideals, which look so transcendental and beautiful from inside, says the wiseacre, are really only a mass of biological instincts and inherited taboos. And no one plays the game the other way round by replying, "If you will only step inside, the things that look to you like instincts and taboos will suddenly reveal their real and transcendental nature." That, in fact, is the whole basis of the specifically modern type of thought. And is it not, you will ask, a very sensible basis? For after all, we are often deceived by things from the inside. For example, the girl who looks so wonderful while we're in love may really be a very plain, stupid, and disagreeable person. The savage's dance to Nyonga does not really cause the crops to grow. Having been so often deceived by looking along, are we not well advised to trust only to looking at? In fact, to discount all these inside experiences, well, no. There are two fatal objections to discounting them all, and the first is this: you discount them in order to think more accurately, but you can't think at all, and therefore, of course, can't think accurately if you have nothing to think about. A physiologist, for example, can study pain and find out that it is whatever is means such and such neural events. But the word pain would have no meaning for him unless he had been inside by actually suffering. If he had never looked along pain, he simply wouldn't know what he was looking at. The very subject for his inquiries from outside exists for him only because he has, at least once, been inside. This case is not likely to occur because every man has felt pain. But it is perfectly easy to go on all your life giving explanations of religion, love, morality, honor, and the like, without having been inside any of them. And if you do that, you are simply playing with counters. You go on explaining a thing without knowing what it is. That is why a great deal of contemporary thought is, strictly speaking, thought about nothing. All the apparatus of thought busily working in a vacuum. The other objection is this. Let us go back to the tool shed. I might have discounted what I saw when looking along the beam, i.e., the leaves moving and the sun, on the ground that it was really only a strip of dusty light in a dark shed. That is, I might have set up as true my side vision of the beam, but then that side vision is itself an instance of the activity we call seeing, and this new instance could also be looked at from outside. I could allow a scientist to tell me that what seemed to be a beam of light in a shed was really only an agitation of my own optic nerves, and that would be just as good or as bad a bit of debunking as the previous one. The picture of the beam in the tool shed would now have to be discounted just as the previous picture of the trees and the sun had been discounted. And then, where are you? In other words, you can step outside one experience only by stepping inside another. Therefore, if all inside experiences are misleading, we are always misled. The cerebral physiologist may say, if he chooses, that the mathematician's thought is only tiny physical movements of the grey matter. But then, what about the cerebral physiologist's own thought at that very moment? A second physiologist looking at it could pronounce it also to be only tiny physical movements in the first physiologist's skull. Where is the rot to end? The answer is that we must never allow the rot to begin. We must, on pain of idiocy, deny from the very outset the idea that looking at is, by its own nature, intrinsically truer or better than looking along. One must look both along and at everything. In particular cases, we shall find reason for regarding the one or the other vision as inferior. Thus, the inside vision of rational thinking must be truer than the outside vision, which sees only movements of the grey matter. 
for if the outside vision were the correct one, all thought, including this thought itself, would be valueless, and this is self-contradictory. You cannot have a proof that no proofs matter. On the other hand, the inside vision of the savages down to Nyonga may be found deceptive because we find reason to believe that crops and babies are not really affected by it. In fact, we must take each case on its merits. But we must start with no prejudice for or against either kind of looking. We do not know in advance whether the lover or the psychologist is giving the more correct account of love, or whether both accounts are equally correct in different ways, or whether both are equally wrong. We just have to find out. But the period of browbeating has got to end. 7. Scraps 1. Yes, my friend said, I don't see why there shouldn't be books in heaven. But you will find that your library in heaven contains only some of the books you had on earth. Which? I asked. The ones you gave away or lent. I hope the lent ones won't still have all the borrower's dirty thumb marks, said I. Oh, yes, they will, said he. But just as the wounds of the martyrs will have turned into beauties, so you will find that the thumb marks have turned into beautiful illuminated capitals or exquisite marginal woodcuts. 2. The angels, he said, have no senses. Their experience is purely intellectual and spiritual. That is why we know something about God which they don't. There are particular aspects of his love and joy which can be communicated to a created being only by sensuous experience. Something of God which the seraphim can never quite understand flows into us from the blue of the sky, the taste of honey, the delicious embrace of water, whether cold or hot, and even from sleep itself. 3. You are always dragging me down, said I to my body. Dragging you down, replied my body. Well, I like that. Who taught me to like tobacco and alcohol? You, of course, with your idiotic adolescent idea of being grown up. My palate loathed both at first, but you would have your way. Who put an end to all those angry and revengeful thoughts last night? Me, of course, by insisting on going to sleep. Who does his best to keep you from talking too much and eating too much by giving you dry throats and headaches and indigestion, eh? And what about sex, said I? Yes, what about it, retorted the body. If you and your wretched imagination would leave me alone, I'd give you no trouble. That soul all over. You give me orders and then blame me for carrying them out. 4. Praying for particular things, said I, always seems to me like advising God how to run the world. Wouldn't it be wiser to assume that he knows best? On the same principle, said he, I suppose you never ask a man next to you to pass the salt, because God knows best whether you ought to have salt or not. And I suppose you never take an umbrella, because God knows best whether you ought to be wet or dry. That's quite different, I protested. I don't see why, said he. The odd thing is that he should let us influence the course of events at all. But since he lets us do it in one way, I don't see why he shouldn't let us do it in the other. 8. The Decline of Religion From what I see of Junior Oxford at present, it would be quite easy to draw opposite conclusions about the religious predicament of what we call the rising generation though in reality the undergraduate body includes men and women almost as much divided from one another in age, outlook and experience as they are divided from the dons. Plenty of evidence can be produced to show that religion is in its last decline among them, or that a revival of interest in religion is one of their most noticeable characteristics. And in fact, something that may be called a decline and something that may be called a revival are both going on. It will be perhaps more useful to attempt to understand both than to try our luck at spotting the winner. The decline of religion, so often lamented or welcomed, is held to be shown by empty chapels. Now it is quite true that chapels which were full in 1900 are empty in 1946. But this change was not gradual. It occurred at the precise moment when chapels ceased to be compulsory. It was not, in fact, a decline. It was a precipice. The sixty men who had come because chapel was a little later than rollers, its only alternative, came no more. The five Christians remained. The withdrawal of compulsion did not create a new religious situation, but only revealed the situation which had long existed, 
and this is typical of the decline in religion all over England. In every class and every part of the country, the visible practice of Christianity has grown very much less in the last fifty years. This is often taken to show that the nation as a whole has passed from a Christian to a secular outlook. But if we judge the nineteenth century from the books it wrote, the outlook of our grandfathers, with a very few exceptions, was quite as secular as our own. The novels of Meredith, Trollope, and Thackeray are not written either by or for men who see this world as the vestibule of eternity, who regard pride as the greatest of sins, who desire to be poor in spirit and look for a supernatural salvation. Even more significant is the absence from Dickens' Christmas Carol of any interest in the Incarnation. Mary, the Magi, and the angels are replaced by spirits of his own invention, and the animals present are not the ox and the ass in the stable, but the goose and the turkey in the poulterer's shop. Most striking of all is the thirty-third chapter of the Antiquary, where Lord Glenallan forgives old Elspeth for her intolerable wrong. Glenallan has been painted by Scott as a lifelong penitent and ascetic, a man whose every thought has been for years fixed on the supernatural. But when he has to forgive, no motive of a Christian kind is brought into play. The battle is won by the generosity of his nature. It does not occur to Scott that his facts, his solitudes, his beads, and his confessor, however useful as romantic properties, could be effectively connected with a serious action which concerns the plot of the book. I am anxious here not to be misunderstood. I do not mean that Scott was not a brave, generous, honourable man and a glorious writer. I mean that in his work, as in that of most of his contemporaries, only secular and natural values are taken seriously. Plato and Virgil are, in that sense, nearer to Christianity than they. Thus, the decline of religion becomes a very ambiguous phenomenon. One way of putting the truth would be that the religion which has declined was not Christianity. It was a vague theism with a strong and virile ethical code, which, far from standing over against the world, was absorbed into the whole fabric of English institutions and sentiment, and therefore demanded church-going as, at best, a part of loyalty and good manners, as, at worst, a proof of respectability. Hence, the social pressure, like the withdrawal of the compulsion, did not create a new situation. The new freedom first allowed accurate observations to be made. When no man goes to church except because he seeks Christ, the number of actual believers can at last be discovered. It should be added that this new freedom was partly caused by the very conditions which it revealed. If the various anti-clerical and anti-theistic forces at work in the nineteenth century had had to attack a solid phalanx of radical Christians, the story might have been different. But mere religion, morality tinged with emotion. What a man does with his solitude, the religion of all good men, has little power of resistance. It is not good at saying no. The decline of religion, thus understood, seems to me in some ways a blessing. At the very worst, it makes the issue clear. To the modern undergraduate, Christianity is at least one of the intellectual options. It is, so to speak, on the agenda. It can be discussed, and a conversion may follow. I can remember times when this was much more difficult. Religion, as distinct from Christianity, was too vague to be discussed, too sacred to be lightly mentioned, and so mixed up with sentiment and good form as to be one of the embarrassing subjects. If it had to be spoken of, it was spoken of in a hushed medical voice. Something of the shame of the cross is and ought to be irremovable, but the merely social and sentimental embarrassment is gone. The fog of religion has lifted. The positions and numbers of both armies can be observed, and real shooting is now possible. The decline of religion is no doubt a bad thing for the world. By it, all the things that made England a fairly happy country are, I suppose, endangered. The comparative purity of her public life, the comparative humanity of her police, and the possibility of some mutual respect and kindness between political opponents. But I am not clear that it makes conversions to Christianity rarer or more difficult; rather, the reverse. It makes the choice more unescapable. When the round table is broken, every man must follow either Galahad or Mordred. Middle things are gone. So much for the decline of religion. Now for a Christian revival. Those who claim that there is such a revival would point to the success, 
I mean success in the sense that it can be tested by sales of several explicitly and even violently Christian writers. The apparent popularity of lectures on theological subjects and the brisk atmosphere of not unfriendly discussion on them in which we live. They point, in fact, to what I have heard described as the highbrow Christian racket. It is difficult to describe the phenomenon in quite neutral terms, but perhaps no one would deny that Christianity is now on the map among the younger intelligentsia as it was not, say, in 1920. Only freshmen now talk as if the anti-Christian position were self-evident. The days of simple unfaith are as dead as those of simple faith. At this, those who are on the same side as myself are quite properly pleased. We have cause to give thanks. And the comments which I have to add proceed, I hope, not from a natural middle-aged desire to pour cold water into any soup within reach, but only from a desire to forestall, and therefore to disarm, possible disappointments. In the first place, it must be admitted by anyone who accepts Christianity that an increased interest in it, or even a growing measure of intellectual assent to it, is a very different thing from the conversion of England or even of a single soul. Conversion requires an alteration of the will, and an alteration which, in the last resort, does not occur without the intervention of the supernatural. I do not in the least agree with those who therefore conclude that the spread of an intellectual and imaginative climate favorable to Christianity is useless. You do not prove munition workers useless by showing that they cannot themselves win battles, however proper this reminder would be if they attempted to claim the honor due to fighting men. If the intellectual climate is such that, when a man comes to the crisis at which he must either accept or reject Christ, his reason and imagination are not on the wrong side— then his conflict will be fought out under favorable conditions. Those who help to produce and spread such a climate are therefore doing useful work. And yet no such great matter after all. Their share is a modest one, and it is always possible that nothing, nothing whatever, may come of it. Far higher than they stands that character whom, to the best of my knowledge, the present Christian movement has not yet produced. The preacher, in the full sense, the evangelist, the man on fire, the man who infects. The propagandist, the apologist, only represents John Baptist. The preacher represents the Lord himself. He will be sent, or else he will not. But unless he comes, we mere Christian intellectuals will not effect very much. That does not mean we should down tools. In the second place, we must remember that a widespread and lively interest in a subject is precisely what we call a fashion and it is the nature of fashions not to last. The present Christian movement may or may not have a long run ahead of it, but sooner or later it must lose the public ear. In a place like Oxford, such changes are extraordinarily rapid. Bradley and the other idealists fell in a few terms, the Douglas scheme even more suddenly, the Vorticists overnight. Who now remembers Pogo? Who now reads Childermas? Whatever in our present success mere fashion has given us, mere fashion will presently withdraw. The real conversions will remain, but nothing else will. In that sense we may be on the brink of a real and permanent Christian revival, but it will work slowly and obscurely and in small groups. The present sunshine, if I may so call it, is certainly temporary. The grain must be got into the barns before the wet weather comes. This mutability is the fate of all movements, fashions, intellectual climates, and the like. But a Christian movement is also up against something sterner than the mere fickleness of fate. We have not yet had, at least in junior Oxford, any really bitter opposition. But if we have many more successes, this will certainly appear. The enemy has not yet thought it worth while to fling his whole weight against us, but he soon will. This happens in the history of every Christian movement, beginning with the ministry of Christ himself. At first it is welcome to all who have no special reason for opposing it. At this stage, he who is not against it is for it. What men notice is its difference from those aspects of the world which they already dislike. But later on, as the real meaning of the Christian claim becomes apparent— its demand for total surrender, the sheer chasm between nature and supernature, men are increasingly offended. Dislike, terror, and finally hatred succeed. None who will not give it what it asks, and it asks all, can endure it. All who are not with it are against it. 
That is why we must cherish no picture of the present intellectual movement simply growing and spreading and finally reclaiming millions by sweet reasonableness. Long before it became as important as that, the real opposition would have begun. And to be on the Christian side would be costing a man, at the least, his career. But remember, in England, the opposition will quite likely be called Christianity, or Christo-democracy, or British Christianity, or something of that kind. I think, but how should I know, that all is going reasonably well. But it is early days. Neither our armour nor our enemies is yet engaged. Combatants always tend to imagine that the war is further on than it really is. 9. Vivisection It is the rarest thing in the world to hear a rational discussion of vivisection. Those who disapprove of it are commonly accused of sentimentality, and very often their arguments justify the accusation. They paint pictures of pretty little dogs on dissecting tables. But the other side lie open to exactly the same charge. They also often defend the practice by drawing pictures of suffering women and children whose pain can be relieved, we are assured, only by the fruits of vivisection. The one appeal, quite as clearly as the other, is addressed to emotion, to the particular emotion we call pity. And neither appeal proves anything. If the thing is right, and if right at all, it is a duty, then pity for the animal is one of the temptations we must resist in order to perform that duty. If the thing is wrong, then pity for human suffering is precisely the temptation which will most probably lure us into doing that wrong thing. But the real question, whether it is right or wrong, remains meanwhile just where it was. A rational discussion of this subject begins by inquiring whether pain is or is not an evil. If it is not, then the case against vivisection falls. But then so does the case for vivisection. If it is not defended on the ground that it reduces human suffering, on what ground can it be defended? And if pain is not an evil, why should human suffering be reduced? We must therefore assume as a basis for the whole discussion that pain is an evil, otherwise there is nothing to be discussed. Now, if pain is an evil, then the infliction of pain, considered in itself, must clearly be an evil act. But there are such things as necessary evils. Some acts which would be bad simply in themselves may be excusable and even laudable when they are necessary means to a greater good. In saying that the infliction of pain simply in itself is bad, we are not saying that pain ought never to be inflicted. Most of us think that it can rightly be inflicted for a good purpose, as in dentistry, or just and reformatory punishment. The point is that it always requires justification. On the man whom we find inflicting pain rests the burden of showing why an act which in itself would be simply bad is, in those particular circumstances, good. If we find a man giving pleasure, it is for us to prove, if we criticize him, that his action is wrong. But if we find a man inflicting pain, it is for him to prove that his action is right. If he cannot... He is a wicked man. Now vivisection can only be defended by showing it to be right that one species should suffer in order that another species should be happier. And here we come to the parting of the ways. The Christian defender and the ordinary scientist, i.e. naturalistic defender of vivisection, have to take quite different lines. The Christian defender, especially in the Latin countries, is very apt to say that we are entitled to do anything we please to animals because they have no souls. But what does this mean? If it means that animals have no consciousness, then how is this known? They certainly behave as if they had, or at least the higher animals do. I myself am inclined to think that far fewer animals than is supposed have what we should recognize as consciousness. But that is only an opinion. Unless we know on other grounds that vivisection is right, we must not take the moral risk of tormenting them on a mere opinion. On the other hand, the statement that they have no souls may mean that they have no moral responsibilities and are not immortal. But the absence of soul, in that sense, makes the infliction of pain upon them not easier but harder to justify. For it means that animals cannot deserve pain, nor profit morally by the discipline of pain, nor be recompensed by happiness in another life for suffering in this. Thus, all the factors which render pain more tolerable, or make it less totally evil in the case of human beings, will be lacking in the beasts. Soullessness 
insofar as it is relevant to the question at all, is an argument against vivisection. The only rational line for the Christian vivisectionist to take is to say that the superiority of man over beast is a real objective fact, guaranteed by revelation, and that the propriety of sacrificing beast to man is a logical consequence. We are worth more than many sparrows, Matthew 10, verse 31. And in saying this, we are not merely expressing a natural preference for our own species simply because it is our own, but conforming to a hierarchical order created by God and really present in the universe whether anyone acknowledges it or not. The position may not be satisfactory. We may fail to see how a benevolent deity could wish us to draw such conclusions from the hierarchical order he has created. We may find it difficult to formulate a human right of tormenting beasts in terms which would not equally imply an angelic right of tormenting men. And we may feel that though objective superiority is rightly claimed for man, yet that very superiority ought partly to consist in not behaving like a vivisector, that we ought to prove ourselves better than the beasts precisely by the fact of acknowledging duties to them which they do not acknowledge to us. But on all these questions, different opinions can be honestly held. If on grounds of our real, divinely ordained superiority, a Christian pathologist thinks it right to vivisect, and does so with scrupulous care to avoid the least dram or scruple of unnecessary pain, in a trembling awe at the responsibility which he assumes, and with a vivid sense of the high mode in which human life must be lived, if it is to justify the sacrifices made for it, then, whether we agree with him or not, we can respect his point of view. But of course the vast majority of vivisectors have no such theological background. They are most of them naturalistic and Darwinian. Now here, surely, we come up against a very alarming fact. The very same people who will most contemptuously brush aside any consideration of animal suffering, if it stands in the way of research, will also, on another context, most vehemently deny that there is any radical difference between man and the other animals. On the naturalistic view, the beasts are, at bottom, just the same sort of thing as ourselves. Man is simply the cleverest of the anthropoids. All the grounds on which a Christian might defend vivisection are thus cut from under our feet. We sacrifice other species to our own, not because our own has any objective metaphysical privilege over others, but simply because it is ours. It may be very natural to have this loyalty to our own species, But let us hear no more from the naturalist about the sentimentality of anti-vivisectionists. If loyalty to our own species, preference for man simply because we are men, is not a sentiment, then what is? It may be a good sentiment or a bad one, but a sentiment it certainly is. Try to base it on logic and see what happens. But the most sinister thing about modern vivisection is this. If a mere sentiment justifies cruelty... Why stop at a sentiment for the whole human race? There is also a sentiment for the white man against the black, for a heron folk against the non-Aryans, for civilized or progressive peoples against savage or backward peoples. Finally, for our own country, party or class against others. Once the old Christian idea of a total difference in kind between man and beast has been abandoned, then no argument for experiments on animals can be found which is not also an argument for experiments on inferior men. If we cut up beasts simply because they cannot prevent us and because we are backing our side in the struggle for existence, it is only logical to cut up imbeciles, criminals, enemies or capitalists for the same reasons. Indeed, experiments on men have already begun. We all hear that Nazi scientists have done them. We all suspect that our own scientists may begin to do so in secret at any moment. The alarming thing is that the vivisectors have won the first round. In the 19th and 18th century, a man was not stamped as a crank for protesting against vivisection. Lewis Carroll protested, if I remember his famous letter correctly, on the very same ground which I have just used. Dr. Johnson, a man whose mind had as much iron in it as any man's, protested in a note on Cymbeline, which is worth quoting in full. In Act I, Scene Five, the Queen explains to the Doctor that she wants poisons to experiment on such creatures as we count not worth the hanging, but none human. The Doctor replies, Your Highness shall from this practice but make hard your heart. Johnson comments, 
the thought would probably have been more amplified had our author lived to be shocked with such experiments as have been published in later times by a race of men that have practiced tortures without pity and related them without shame and are yet suffered to erect their heads among human beings. The words are his, not mine, and in truth we hardly dare in these days to use such calmly stern language. The reason why we do not dare is that the other side has, in fact, won. And though cruelty even to beasts is an important matter, their victory is symptomatic of matters more important still. The victory of vivisection marks a great advance in the triumph of ruthless, non-moral utilitarianism over the old world of ethical law, a triumph in which we, as well as the animals, are already the victims, and of which Dachau and Hiroshima mark the more recent achievements. In justifying cruelty to animals, we put ourselves also on the animal level. We choose the jungle and must abide by our choice. You will notice I have spent no time in discussing what actually goes on in the laboratories. We shall be told, of course, that there is surprisingly little cruelty. That is a question with which, at present, I have nothing to do. We must first decide what should be allowed. After that, it is for the police to discover what is already being done. 10. Modern Translations of the Bible This essay was originally published as an introduction to J. B. Phillips' Letters to Young Churches, a translation of the New Testament Epistles, London, 1947. It is possible that the reader who opens this volume on the counter of a bookshop may ask himself why we need a new translation of any part of the Bible, and, if of any, why of the Epistles. Do we not already possess, it may be said, in the authorized version, the most beautiful rendering which any language can boast? Some people whom I have met go even further and feel that a modern translation is not only unnecessary but even offensive. They cannot bear to see the time-honored words altered. It seems to them irreverent. There are several answers to such people— in the first place, the kind of objection which they feel to a new translation is very like the objection which was once felt to any English translation at all. Dozens of sincerely pious people in the 16th century shuddered at the idea of turning the time-honored Latin of the Vulgate into a common and, as they thought, barbarous English. A sacred truth seemed to them to have lost its sanctity when it was stripped of the polysyllable Latin, long heard at Mass and at hours, and put into language such as men do use, language steeped in all the commonplace associations of the nursery, the inn, the stable, and the street. The answer then was the same as the answer now. The only kind of sanctity which Scripture can lose, or at least New Testament scripture, by being modernized, is an accidental kind, which it never had for its writers or its earliest readers. The New Testament in the original Greek is not a work of literary art. It is not written in a solemn, ecclesiastical language. It is written in the sort of Greek which was spoken over the Eastern Mediterranean after Greek had become an international language, and therefore lost its real beauty and subtlety. In it we see Greek used by people who have no real feeling for Greek words, because Greek words are not the words they spoke when they were children. It is a sort of basic Greek, a language without roots in the soil, a utilitarian, commercial, and administrative language. Does this shock us? It ought not to, except as the incarnation itself ought to shock us. The same divine humility which decreed that God should become a baby at a peasant woman's breast, and later an arrested field preacher in the hands of the Roman police, decreed also that he should be preached in a vulgar, prosaic, and unliterary language. If you can stomach the one, you can stomach the other. The Incarnation is, in that sense, an irreverent doctrine. Christianity, in that sense, an incurably irreverent religion. When we expect that it should have come before the world in all the beauty that we now feel in the authorized version, we are as wide of the mark as the Jews were in expecting that the Messiah would come as a great earthly king. The real sanctity, the real beauty and sublimity of the New Testament, as of Christ's life, are of a different sort, miles deeper or further in. In the second place, the authorized version has ceased to be a good, that is, a clear translation. It is no longer modern English. The meanings of words have changed. The same antique glamour which has made it, in the superficial sense, so beautiful, so sacred, so comforting, and so inspiring, has also made it, in many places, unintelligible. Thus, where St. Paul says, 
I know nothing against myself. It translates, I know nothing by myself. That was a good translation, though even then rather old-fashioned in the 16th century. To the modern reader it means either nothing or something quite different from what St. Paul said. The truth is that if we are to have translation at all, we must have periodical re-translation. There is no such thing as translating a book into another language once and for all, for a language is a changing thing. If your son is to have clothes, it is no good buying him a suit once and for all. He will grow out of it and have to be reclothed. And finally, though it may seem a sour paradox, we must sometimes get away from the authorized version, if for no other reason, simply because it is so beautiful and so solemn. Beauty exalts, but beauty also lulls. Early associations endear, but they also confuse. Through that beautiful solemnity, the transporting or horrifying realities of which the book tells may come to us blunted and disarmed, and we may only sigh with tranquil veneration when we ought to be burning with shame, or struck dumb with terror, or carried out of ourselves by ravishing hopes and adorations. Does the word scourged really come home to us like flogged? Does mocked him sting like jeered at him? We ought therefore to welcome all new translations, when they are made by sound scholars, and most certainly those who are approaching the Bible for the first time will be wise not to begin with the authorized version, except perhaps for the historical books of the Old Testament, where its archaisms suit the saga-like material well enough. Among modern translations, those of Dr. James Moffat and Monsignor Ronald A. Knox seem to me particularly good. The present volume concentrates on the epistles and furnishes more help to the beginner. Its scope is different. The preliminary abstracts to each letter will be found especially useful, and the reader who has not read the letters before might do well to begin by reading and reflecting on these abstracts at some length before he attempts to tackle the text. It would have saved me a great deal of labor if this book had come into my hands when I first seriously began to try to discover what Christianity was. For a man who wants to make that discovery must face the epistles. And whether we like it or not, most of them are by St. Paul. He is the Christian author whom no one can bypass. A most astonishing misconception has long dominated the modern mind on the subject of St. Paul. It is to this effect, that Jesus preached a kindly and simple religion found in the Gospels, and that St. Paul afterwards corrupted it into a cruel and complicated religion found in the epistles. This is really quite untenable. All the most terrifying texts come from the mouth of our Lord. All the texts on which we can base such warrant as we have for hoping that all men will be saved come from St. Paul. If it could be proved that St. Paul altered the teaching of his Master in any way, he altered it in exactly the opposite way to that which is popularly supposed. But there is no real evidence for a pre-Pauline doctrine different from St. Paul's. The epistles are, for the most part, the earliest Christian documents we possess. The Gospels come later. They are not the Gospel, the statement of the Christian belief. They were written for those who had already been converted, who had already accepted the Gospel. They leave out many of the complications, that is, the theology, because they are intended for readers who have already been instructed in it. In that sense, the epistles are more primitive and more central than the Gospels though not, of course, than the great events which the Gospels recount. God's act, the incarnation, the crucifixion, and the resurrection, comes first. The earliest theological analysis of it comes in the epistles. Then, when the generation who had known the Lord was dying out, the Gospels were composed to provide for believers a record of the great act and of some of the Lord's sayings. The ordinary popular conception has put everything upside down, nor is the cause far to seek. In the earlier history of every rebellion, there is a stage at which you do not yet attack the king in person. You say, the king is all right, it is his ministers who are wrong. They misrepresent him and corrupt all his plans, which, I'm sure, are good plans if only the ministers would let them take effect. And the first victory consists in beheading a few ministers. Only at a later stage do you go on and behead the king himself. In the same way, the 19th century attack on St. Paul was really only a stage in the revolt against Christ. Men were not ready in large numbers to attack Christ himself. They made the normal first move, that of attacking one of his principal ministers. 
Everything they disliked in Christianity was, therefore, attributed to St. Paul. It was unfortunate that their case could not impress anyone who had really read the Gospels and the Epistles with attention. But apparently few people had, and so the first victory was won. St. Paul was impeached and banished, and the world went on to the next step, the attack on the king himself. But to those who wish to know what St. Paul and his fellow teachers really said, the present volume will give very great help. 11. Priestesses in the Church I should like balls infinitely better, said Caroline Bingley, if they were carried on in a different manner. It would surely be much more rational if conversation instead of dancing made the order of the day. Oh, much more rational, I dare say, replied her brother, but it would not be near so much like a ball. We are told that the lady was silenced. Yet it could be maintained that Jane Austen has not allowed Bingley to put forward the full strength of his position. He ought to have replied with a distinguo. In one sense, conversation is more rational, for conversation may exercise the reason alone, dancing does not. But there is nothing irrational in exercising other powers than our reason. On certain occasions, and for certain purposes, the real irrationality is with those who will not do so. The man who would try to break a horse, or write a poem, or beget a child by pure syllogizing would be an irrational man. Though at the same time, syllogizing is in itself a more rational activity than the activities demanded by these achievements. It is rational not to reason, or not to limit oneself to reason in the wrong place. And the more rational a man is, the better he knows this. These remarks are not intended as a contribution to the criticism of pride and prejudice. They came into my head when I heard that the Church of England was being advised to declare women capable of priests' orders. I am indeed informed that such a proposal is very unlikely to be seriously considered by the authorities. To take such a revolutionary step at the present moment, to cut ourselves off from the Christian past, and to widen the divisions between ourselves and other churches by establishing an order of priestesses in our midst, would be an almost wanton degree of imprudence. And the Church of England herself would be torn in shreds by the operation. My concern with the proposal is of a more theoretical kind. The question involves something even deeper than a revolution in order. I have every respect for those who wish women to be priestesses. I think they are sincere and pious and sensible people. Indeed, in a way, they are too sensible. That is where my descent from them resembles Bingley's descent from his sister. I am tempted to say that the proposed arrangement would make us much more rational, but not near so much like a church. For at first sight all the rationality, in Caroline Bingley's sense, is on the side of the innovators. We are short of priests. We have discovered in one profession after another that women can do very well all sorts of things which were once supposed to be in the power of men alone. No one among those who dislike the proposal is maintaining that women are less capable than men of piety, zeal, learning, and whatever else seems necessary for the pastoral office. What then, except prejudice begotten by tradition, forbids us to draw on the huge reserves which could pour into the priesthood if women were here, as in so many other professions, put on the same footing as men? And against this flood of common sense, the opposers, many of them women, can produce at first nothing but an inarticulate distaste, a sense of discomfort which they themselves find it hard to analyse. That this reaction does not spring from any contempt for women is, I think, plain from history. The Middle Ages carried their reverence for one woman to a point at which the charge could be plausibly made that the Blessed Virgin became in their eyes almost a fourth person of the Trinity. But never, so far as I know, in all those ages was anything remotely resembling a sacerdotal office attributed to her. All salvation depends on the decision which she made in the words Eke and Silla. She is united in nine months' inconceivable intimacy with the eternal word. She stands at the foot of the cross. But she is absent both from the Last Supper and from the descent of the Spirit at Pentecost. Such is the record of Scripture. Nor can you daff it aside by saying that local and temporary conditions condemned women to silence and private life. There were female preachers. One man had four daughters who all prophesied, i.e. preached. There were prophetesses even in Old Testament times. Prophetesses, not priestesses. 
At this point, the common sensible reformer is apt to ask why, if women can preach, they cannot do all the rest of a priest's work. This question deepens the discomfort of my side. We begin to feel that what really divides us from our opponents is a difference between the meaning which they and we give to the word priest. The more they speak, and speak truly, about the competence of women in administration, their tact and sympathy as advisers, their national talent for visiting, the more we feel that the central thing is being forgotten. To us a priest is primarily a representative, a double representative, who represents us to God and God to us. Our very eyes teach us this in church. Sometimes the priest turns his back on us and faces the east. He speaks to God for us. Sometimes he faces us and speaks to us for God. We have no objection to a woman doing the first. The whole difficulty is about the second. But why? Why should a woman not in this sense represent God? Certainly not because she is necessarily or even probably less holy or less charitable or stupider than a man. In that sense she may be as godlike as a man, and a given woman much more so than a given man. The sense in which she cannot represent God will perhaps be plainer if we look at the thing the other way round. Suppose the reformer stops saying that a good woman may be like God, and begins saying that God is like a good woman. Suppose he says that we might just as well pray to our mother which art in heaven as to our father. Suppose he suggests that the incarnation might just as well have taken a female as a male form, and the second person of the Trinity be as well called the daughter as the son. Suppose, finally, that the mystical marriage were reversed, that the church were the bridegroom and Christ the bride. All this, it seems to me, is involved in the claim that a woman can represent God as a priest does. Now it is surely the case that if all these supposals were ever carried into effect, we should be embarked on a different religion. Goddesses have, of course, been worshipped, Many religions have had priestesses, but they are religions quite different in character from Christianity. Common sense, disregarding the discomfort, or even the horror which the idea of turning all our theological language into the feminine gender arouses in most Christians, will ask, why not? Since God is in fact not a biological being and has no sex, what can it matter whether we say he or she, father or mother, son or daughter? But Christians think that God himself has taught us how to speak of him. To say that it does not matter is to say either that all the masculine imagery is not inspired, is merely human in origin, or else that, though inspired, it is quite arbitrary and unessential. And this is surely intolerable. Or if tolerable, it is an argument not in favor of Christian priestesses, but against Christianity. It is also surely based on a shallow view of imagery, Without drawing upon religion, we know from our poetical experience that image and apprehension cleave closer together than common sense is here prepared to admit, that a child who has been taught to pray to a mother in heaven would have a religious life radically different from that of a Christian child. And as image and apprehension are in an organic unity, so for a Christian are human body and human soul. The innovators are really implying that sex is something superficial, irrelevant to the spiritual life. To say that men and women are equally eligible for a certain profession is to say that for the purposes of that profession their sex is irrelevant. We are, within that context, treating both as neuters. As the state grows more like a hive or an anthill, it needs an increasing number of workers who can be treated as neuters. This may be inevitable for our secular life, but in our Christian life we must return to reality. There we are not homogeneous units, but different and complementary organs of a mystical body. Lady Nunbernholm has claimed that the equality of men and women is a Christian principle. I do not remember the text in Scripture, nor the Fathers, nor Hooker, nor the prayer book which asserts it. But that is not here my point. The point is that unless equal means interchangeable, equality makes nothing for the priesthood of women. And the kind of equality which implies that the equals are interchangeable, like counters or identical machines, is, among humans, a legal fiction. It may be a useful legal fiction, but in church we turn our back on fictions. One of the ends for which sex was created was to symbolize to us the hidden things of God. One of the functions of human marriage is to express the nature of the union between Christ and the church. 
We have no authority to take the living and semitive figures which God has painted on the canvas of our nature and shift them about as if they were mere geometrical figures. This is what common sense will call mystical. Exactly. The church claims to be the bearer of a revelation. If that claim is false, then we want not to make priestesses, but to abolish priests. If it is true, then we should expect to find in the church an element which unbelievers will call irrational and which believers will call supra-rational. There ought to be something in it opaque to our reason, though not contrary to it, as the facts of sex and sense on the natural level are opaque. And that is the real issue. The Church of England can remain a church only if she retains this opaque element. If we abandon that, if we retain only what can be justified by standards of prudence and convenience at the bar of enlightened common sense, then we exchange revelation for that old race, natural religion. It is painful, being a man, to have to assert the privilege or the burden which Christianity lays upon my own sex. I am crushingly aware how inadequate most of us are in our actual and historical individualities to fill the place prepared for us. But it is an old saying in the army that you salute the uniform, not the wearer. Only one wearing the masculine uniform can, provisionally, until the parousia, represent the Lord to the church. For we are all corporately and individually feminine to him. We men may often make very bad priests. That is because we are insufficiently masculine. It is no cure to call in those who are not masculine at all. A given man may make a very bad husband. You cannot mend matters by trying to reverse the roles. He may make a bad male partner in a dance. The cure for that is that men should more diligently attend dancing classes, not that the ballroom should henceforward ignore distinction of sex and treat all dancers as neuter. That would, of course, be eminently sensible, civilized and enlightened, but once more, not near so much like a ball. And this parallel between the church and the ball is not so fanciful as some would think. The church ought to be more like a ball than it is like a factory or a political party. Or, to speak more strictly, they are at the circumference and the church at the center and the ball comes in between. The factory and the political party are artificial creations. A breath can make them as a breath has made. In them we are not dealing with human beings in their concrete entirety, only with hands or voters. I am not, of course, using artificial in any derogatory sense. Such artifices are necessary, but because they are our artifices, we are free to shuffle, scrap, and experiment as we please. But the ball exists to stylize something which is natural and which concerns human beings in their entirety namely courtship. We cannot shuffle or tamper so much. With the church we are farther in, for there we are dealing with male and female not merely as facts of nature, but as the live and awful shadows of realities utterly beyond our control and largely beyond our direct knowledge. Or rather, we are not dealing with them, but, as we shall soon learn if we meddle, they are dealing with us. 12. God in the Dock I have been asked to write about the difficulties which a man must face in trying to present the Christian faith to modern unbelievers. That is too wide a subject for my capacity, or even for the scope of an article. The difficulties vary as the audience varies. The audience may be of this or that nation, may be children or adults, learned or ignorant. My own experience is of English audiences only, and almost exclusively of adults. It has, in fact, been mostly of men and women serving in the Royal Air Force. This has meant that while very few of them have been learned in the academic sense of that word, a large number of them have had a smattering of elementary practical science, have been mechanics, electricians, or wireless operators. For the rank and file of the RAF belong to what may almost be called the intelligentsia of the proletariat. I have also talked to students at the universities. These strict limitations in my experience must be kept in mind by the readers. How rash it would be to generalize from such an experience I myself discovered on the single occasion when I spoke to soldiers. It became at once clear to me that the level of intelligence in our army is very much lower than in the RAF, and that quite a different approach was required. 
The first thing I learned from addressing the RAF was that I had been mistaken in thinking materialism to be our only considerable adversary. Among the English intelligentsia of the proletariat, materialism is only one among many non-Christian creeds, theosophy, spiritualism, British Israelitism, etc. England has, of course, always been the home of cranks. I see no sign that they are diminishing. Consistent Marxism I very seldom met. Whether this is because it is very rare, or because men speaking in the presence of their officers concealed it, or because Marxists did not attend the meetings at which I spoke, I have no means of knowing. Even where Christianity was professed, it was often much tainted with pantheistic elements. Strict and well-formed Christian statements, when they occurred at all, usually came from Roman Catholics or from members of extreme Protestant sects, e.g. Baptists. My student audiences shared, in a less degree, the theological vagueness I found in the RAF, but among them strict and well-informed statements came from Anglo-Catholics and Roman Catholics, seldom, if ever, from dissenters. The various non-Christian religions mentioned above hardly appeared. The next thing I learned from the RAF was that the English proletariat is sceptical about history to a degree which academically educated persons can hardly imagine. This, indeed, seems to me to be far the widest cleavage between the learned and unlearned. The educated man habitually, almost without noticing it, sees the present as something that grows out of a long perspective of centuries. In the minds of my RAF hearers, this perspective simply did not exist. It seemed to me that they did not really believe that we have any reliable knowledge of historic man. But this was often curiously combined with a conviction that we knew a great deal about prehistoric man, doubtless because prehistoric man is labelled science, which is reliable, whereas Napoleon or Julius Caesar is labelled as history, which is not. Thus, a pseudo-scientific picture of the caveman and a picture of the present filled almost the whole of their imaginations. Between these there lay only a shadowy and unimportant region in which the phantasmal shapes of Roman soldiers, stagecoaches, pirates, knights in armour, highwaymen, etc. moved in a mist. I had supposed that if my hearers disbelieved the Gospels, they would do so because the Gospels recorded miracles. But my impression is that they disbelieved them simply because they dealt with events that happened a long time ago that they would be almost as incredulous of the Battle of Actium as of the Resurrection, and for the same reason. Sometimes this scepticism was defended by the argument that all books before the invention of printing must have been copied and recopied till the text was changed beyond recognition. And here came another surprise. When their historical scepticism took that rational form, it was sometimes easily allayed by the mere statement that there existed a science called textual criticism, which gave us a reasonable assurance that some ancient texts were accurate. This ready acceptance of the authority of specialists is significant, not only for its ingenuousness, but also because it underlines a fact of which my experiences have, on the whole, convinced me i.e., that very little of the opposition we meet is inspired by malice or suspicion. It is based on genuine doubt, and often on doubt that is reasonable in the state of the doubter's knowledge. My third discovery is of a difficulty which I suspect to be more acute in England than elsewhere. I mean the difficulty occasioned by language. In all societies, no doubt, the speech of the vulgar differs from that of the learned. The English language, with its double vocabulary, Latin and native, English manners, with their boundless indulgence to slang, even in polite circles, and English culture, which allows nothing like the French Academy, make the gap unusually wide. There are almost two languages in this country. The man who wishes to speak to the uneducated in English must learn their language. It is not enough that he should abstain from using what he regards as hard words. He must discover empirically what words exist in the language of his audience and what they mean in that language. E.d. that potential means not possible, but power, that creature means not creature, but animal, that primitive means rude or clumsy, that rude means often scabrous, obscene, that the immaculate conception, except in the mouths of Roman Catholics, means the virgin birth. A being means a personal being. A man who said to me, I believe in the Holy Ghost, but I don't think it is a being, meant, I believe there is such a being, but that it is not personal. 
On the other hand, personal sometimes means corporeal. When an uneducated Englishman says that he believes in God, but not in a personal God, he may mean simply and solely that he is not an anthropomorphist in the strict and original sense of that word. Abstract seems to have two meanings. A. Immaterial. B. Vague, obscure and unpractical. Thus, arithmetic is not, in their language, an abstract science. Practical means often economic or utilitarian. Morality nearly always means chastity. Thus, in their language, the sentence, I do not say that this woman is immoral, but I do say that she is a thief, would not be nonsense, but would mean she is chaste but dishonest. Christian has a eulogistic rather than a descriptive sense, e.g., Christian standards mean simply high moral standards. The proposition, so-and-so is not a Christian, would only be taken to be a criticism of his behavior, never to be merely a statement of his beliefs. It is also important to notice that what would seem to the learned to be the harder of two words may, in fact, to the uneducated, be the easier. Thus, it was recently proposed to amend a prayer used in the Church of England that magistrates may truly and indifferently administer justice to may truly and impartially administer justice. A country priest told me that his sexton understood and could accurately explain the meaning of indifferently, but had no idea of what impartially meant. The popular English language, then, simply has to be learned by him who would preach to the English just as a missionary learns Bantu before preaching to the Bantus. This is the more necessary, because once the lecture or discussion has begun, digressions on the meaning of words tend to bore uneducated audiences, and even to awaken distrust. There is no subject in which they are less interested than philology. Our problem is often simply one of translation. Every examination for ordinance ought to include a passage from some standard theological work for translation into the vernacular. The work is laborious, but it is immediately rewarded. By trying to translate our doctrines into vulgar speech, we discover how much we understand them ourselves. Our failure to translate may sometimes be due to our ignorance of the vernacular. Much more often, it exposes the fact that we do not exactly know what we mean. Apart from this linguistic difficulty, the greatest barrier I have met is the almost total absence from the minds of my audience of any sense of sin. This has struck me more forcibly when I spoke to the RAF than when I spoke to students. Whether, as I believe, the proletariat is more self-righteous than other classes, or whether educated people are cleverer at concealing their pride, this creates for us a new situation. The early Christian preachers could assume in their hearers, whether Jews, Metuentes, or pagans, a sense of guilt. That this was common among pagans is shown by the fact that both Epicureanism and the mystery religions both claimed, though in different ways, to assuage it. Thus, the Christian message was in those days unmistakably the Evangelium, the good news. It promised healing to those who knew they were sick. We have to convince our hearers of the unwelcome diagnosis before we can expect them to welcome the news of the remedy. The ancient man approached God, or even the gods, as the accused person approaches his judge. For the modern man, the roles are reversed. He is the judge. God is in the dark. He is quite a kindly judge. If God should have a reasonable defense for being the God who permits war, poverty, and disease, he is ready to listen to it. The trial may even end in God's acquittal. But the important thing is that man is on the bench and God in the dock. It is generally useless to try to combat this attitude, as older preachers did, by dwelling on sins like drunkenness and unchastity. The modern proletariat is not drunken. As for fornication, contraceptives have made a profound difference. As long as this sin might socially ruin a girl by making her the mother of a bastard, most men recognized the sin as against charity which it involved, and their consciences were often troubled by it. Now that it need have no such consequences, it is not, I think, generally felt to be a sin at all. My own experience suggests that if we can awake the conscience of our hearers at all, we must do so in quite different directions. We must talk of conceit spite, jealousy, cowardice, meanness, etc. But I am very far from believing that I have found the solution of this problem. Finally, 
I must add that my own work has suffered very much from the incurable intellectualism of my approach. The simple emotional appeal, come to Jesus, is still often successful. But those who, like myself, lack the gift for making it, had better not attempt it. 13. Behind the Scenes When I was taken to the theatre as a small boy, what interested me most of all was the stage scenery. The interest was not an aesthetic one. No doubt the gardens, balconies, and palaces of the Edwardian sets looked prettier to me than they would now, but that had nothing to do with it. Ugly scenery would have served my turn just as well. Still less did I mistake these canvas images for realities. On the contrary, I believed and wished all things on the stage to be more artificial than they actually were. When an actor came on in ordinary modern clothes, I never believed he was wearing a real suit with veritable waistcoat and trousers put on in the ordinary way. I thought he was wearing, and I somehow felt he ought to be wearing, some kind of theatrical overalls which were slipped on all in one piece and fastened invisibly up the back. The stage suit ought not to be a suit. It ought to be something quite different, which, nevertheless, that's where the pleasure comes, looked like a suit from the stalls. Perhaps this is why I continued, even after I was grown up, to believe in the cold tea theory. Until a real actor pointed out that a man who played a leading part in a London theatre could afford to, and would certainly rather provide real whisky, if need were, at his own charges, than drink a tumbler of cold tea every evening shortly after his dinner. No. I knew very well that the scenery was painted canvas, that the stage rooms and stage trees seen from behind would not look like rooms or trees at all. That was where the interest lay. That was the fascination of our toy theatre at home, where we made our own scenery. You cut out your piece of cardboard in the shape of a tower, and you painted it, and then you gummed an ordinary nursery block onto the back to make it stand upright. The rapture was to dart to and fro, you went in front, and there was your tower. You went behind, and there, raw brown cardboard and a block. In the real theatre you couldn't go behind, but you knew it would be the same. The moment the actor vanished into the wings, he entered a different world. One knew it was not a world of any particular beauty or wonder. Somebody must have told me, at any rate I believed, it would be a rather dingy world of bare floors and whitewashed walls. The charm lay in the idea of being able thus to pass in and out of a world by taking three strides. One wanted to be an actor, not at that age for the sake of fame or applause, but simply that one might have this privilege of transition, to come from dressing rooms and bare walls and utilitarian corridors, and to come suddenly into Aladdin's cave or the Darling's nursery or whatever it was, to become what you weren't and to be where you weren't. This seemed most enviable. It was best of all when the door at the back of the stage room opened to show a little piece of passage, unreal passage, of course, its panels only canvas, intended to suggest, which one knew to be false, that the sham room on the stage was part of a whole house. You can see just a little peep of the passage in Looking Glass House, and it's very like our passage as far as you can see, only you know it may be quite different on beyond. Thus Alice to the kitten. But the stage passage did not leave one to conjecture. One knew it was quite different on beyond, that it ceased to be a passage at all. I envied the children in stage boxes. If one sat so far to the side as that, then by craning one's neck one might squint along the sham passage and actually see the point at which it ceased to exist, the joint between the real and the apparent. Years afterwards I was behind. The stage was set for an Elizabethan play. The back cloth represented a palace front, with a practicable balcony on it. I stood, from one point of view, on that palace balcony. That is, from the other point of view, I stood on a plank supported by trestles looking out through a square hole in a sheet of canvas. It was a most satisfactory moment. Now what, I wonder, is behind all this? And what, if anything, comes of it? I have no objection to the inclusion of Freudian explanations, provided they are not allowed to exclude all others. It may, as I suppose someone will think, be mixed up with infantile curiosities about the female body. It doesn't feel at all like that. Of course not, they'll reply. You mustn't expect it to. No more than, oh, let's see what would be a good parallel. Why, 
no more than the stage rooms and forests look from the front, like a collection of oddly shaped lath and canvas objects grouped in front of the dusty, drafty, whitewashed place behind. The parallel is fairly exact. The complex, worming its way along in the unimaginable unconscious, and then suddenly transforming itself and gaining admission only by that transformation as it steps into the only mind I can ever directly know, is really very like the actor, with his own unhistrionic expression walking along that bare, draughty offstage and then suddenly appearing as Mr. Darling in the nursery or Aladdin in the cave. But oddly enough, we could fit the Freudian theory into the pleasure I started with quite as easily as we fit it into the Freudian theory. Is it not our pleasure? Even I take some in-depth psychology itself, one instance of this pleasure in the contrast between behind the scenes and on stage. I begin to wonder whether that theatrical antithesis moves us because it is a ready-made symbol of something universal. All sorts of things are, in fact, doing just what the actor does when he comes through the wings. Photons or waves or whatever it is come towards us from the sun through space. They are, in a scientific sense, light. But as they enter the air, they become light in a different sense. What ordinary people call sunlight or day, the bubble of blue or grey or greenish luminosity in which we walk about and see. Day is thus a kind of stage set. Other waves, this time of air, reach my eardrum and travel up a nerve and tickle my brain. All this is behind the scenes, as soundless as the whitewashed passages are undramatic. Then somehow, I've never seen it explained, they step onto the stage. No one can tell me where this stage is, and become, say, a friend's voice, or the Ninth Symphony. Or, of course, my neighbour's wireless. The actor may come on stage to play a drivelling part in a bad play, but there is always the transformation. Biological needs, producing or stimulated by temporary physiological states, climb into a young man's brain, pass on to the mysterious stage and appear as love. It may be, since all sorts of plays are performed there, the love celebrated by Dante, or it may be the love of a Guido or a Mr. Guppy. We can call this the contrast of reality and appearance, but perhaps the fact of having first met it in the theatre will protect us from the threat of derogation which lurks in the word appearance. For in the theatre, of course, the play, the appearance, is the thing. All the backstage realities exist only for its sake and are valuable only in so far as they promote it. A good neutral parable is Schopenhauer's story of the two Japanese who attended an English theatre. One devoted himself to trying to understand the play, although he did not know a word of the language. The other devoted himself in trying to understand how the scenery, lighting and other machinery worked, though he had never been behind the scenes in a theatre. Here, said Schopenhauer, you have the philosopher and the scientist. But for philosopher he might also have written poet, lover, worshipper, citizen, moral agent or plain man. But notice that in two ways Schopenhauer's parable breaks down. The first Japanese could have taken steps to learn English. But have we ever been given any grammar or dictionary? Can we find the teacher of the language in which this universal drama is being performed? Some, I among them, would say yes. Others would say no. The debate continues. And the second Japanese could have taken steps could have pulled wires and got introductions to win admission behind the scenes and see the offstage things for himself. At the very least, he knew there were such things. We lack both these advantages. Nobody can ever go behind. No one can, in any ordinary sense, meet or experience a photon, a sound wave, or the unconscious. That may be one reason why going behind in the theatre is exciting. We are doing what, in most cases, is impossible. We are not even, in the last resort, absolutely sure that such things exist. They are constructs, things assumed to account for our experience, but never to be experienced themselves. They may be assumed with great probability, but they are, after all, hypothetical. Even the offstage existence of the actors is hypothetical. Perhaps they do not exist before they enter the scene. And if they do, then, since we cannot go behind, they may, in their off-stage life and character, be very unlike what we suppose, and very unlike one another.
14. Revival or Decay But would you deny, said the headmaster, that there is here in the West a great, even growing, interest in religion? It is not the sort of question I find easy to answer. Great and growing would seem more to involve statistics, and I had no statistics. I suppose there was a fairly widespread interest, but I didn't feel sure the headmaster was interpreting it correctly. In the days when most people had a religion, what he meant by an interest in religion could hardly have existed. For, of course, religious people, that is, people when they are being religious, are not interested in religion. Men who have gods worship those gods. It is the spectators who describe this as religion. The Menads thought about Dionysus, not about religion. Mutatis mutandis, this goes for Christians, too. The moment a man seriously accepts a deity, his interest in religion is at an end. He's got something else to think about. The ease with which we can now get an audience for a discussion of religion does not prove that more people are becoming religious. What it really proves is the existence of a large floating vote. Every conversion will reduce this potential audience. Once the climate of opinion allows such a floating vote to form, I see no reason why it should speedily diminish. Indecision, often very honest, is very natural. It would be foolish, however, not to realize that it is also no hardship. Floating is a very agreeable operation. A decision either way costs something. Real Christianity and consistent atheism both make demands on a man. But to admit, on occasion, and as possibilities, all the comforts of the one without its discipline, to enjoy all the liberty of the other without its philosophical and emotional abstinences, well, this may be honest, but there's no good pretending it is uncomfortable. And would you further deny, said the headmaster, that Christianity commands more respect in the most highly educated circles than it has done for centuries? The intelligentsia are coming over. Look at men like Maritain, like Bergson, like... But I didn't feel at all happy about this. Of course, the converted intellectual is a characteristic figure of our times, but this phenomenon would be more hopeful if it had not occurred at a moment when the intelligentsia, scientists apart, are losing all touch with and all influence over nearly the whole human race. Our most esteemed poets and critics are read by our most esteemed critics and poets, who don't usually like them much and nobody else takes any notice. An increasing number of highly literate people simply ignore what the highbrows are doing. It says nothing to them. The highbrows, in return, ignore or insult them. Conversions from the intelligentsia are not, therefore, likely to be very widely influential. They may even raise a horrid suspicion that Christianity itself has become a part of the general highbrow racket has been adopted, like surrealism and the pictures painted by chimpanzees, as one more method of shocking the bourgeois. This would be dreadfully uncharitable, no doubt, but then the intelligentsia have said a great many uncharitable things about the others. Then again, boomed the headmaster, even where there is, or is as yet, no explicit religion, do we not see a vast rallying to the defence of those standards which, whether recognised or not, make part of our spiritual heritage? The Western, may I not say the Christian, values? We all winced. And to me in particular there came back the memory of a corrugated iron hut used as an RAF chapel, a few kneeling airmen, and a young chaplain uttering the prayer, Teach us, O Lord, to love the things thou standest for. He was perfectly sincere, and I willingly believe that the things in question included something more and better than the Western values, whatever those may be. And yet, his words seemed to me to imply a point of view incompatible with Christianity, or indeed with any serious theism whatever. God is not, for it, the goal or end. He is, and how fortunate, enlightened has or stands for the right ideals. He is valued for that reason. He ranks admittedly as a leader. But of course a leader leads to something beyond himself. That something else is the real goal. This is miles away from Thou hast made us for thyself, and our heart has no rest till it comes to thee.
The Menads were more religious. And the substitutes for religion are being discredited, continued the headmaster. Science has become more a bogey than a god. The Marxist heaven on earth. And only the other day a lady told me that a girl to whom she had mentioned death replied, Oh, but by the time I'm that age, science will have done something about it. And then I remembered how often, in disputing before simple audiences, I had found the assured belief that whatever was wrong with man would, in the long run, and not so very long a run either, be put right by education. And that led me to think of all the approaches to religion I actually meet. An anonymous postcard tells me that I ought to be flogged at the cart's tail for professing to believe in the virgin birth. A distinguished literary atheist to whom I am introduced mutters, looks away, and walks swiftly to the far end of the room. An unknown American writes to ask me whether Elijah's fiery chariot was really a flying saucer. I encounter theosophists, British Israelites, spiritualists, pantheists. Why do people like the headmaster always talk about religion? Why not religions? We seethe with religions. Christianity, I am pleased to note, is one of them. I get letters from saints who have no notion they are any such thing, showing in every line radiant faith, joy, humility, and even humor in appalling suffering. I get others from converts who want to apologize for some small incivility they committed against me in print years ago. These bits and pieces are all the West I really know at first hand. They escape the headmaster's treatment. He speaks from books and articles. The real sanctities, hatreds, and lunacies which surround us are hardly represented there, still less the great negative factor. It is something more than ignorance, as he would understand the word. Most people's thinking lacks a dimension which he takes for granted. Two instances may make the distinction clear. Once, after I had said something on the air about natural law, an old colonel obviously anima candida, wrote to say that this had interested him very much, and could I just tell him of some handy little brochure which dealt with the subject fully? That is ignorance, striking only in degree. Here is the other. A vet, a workman, and I were wearily stumbling about on a home guard patrol in the small hours. The vet and I got talking about the causes of wars, and arrived at the conclusion that we must expect them to recur. But... But, but, gasped the workman. There was a moment's silence, and he broke out. But then what's the good of the ruddy world going on? I got a very clear impression of what was happening. For the first time in his life, a really ultimate question was before him. The sort of thing we have been considering all our lives, the meaning of existence, had just broken upon him. It was a wholly new dimension. Is there a homogeneous West? I doubt it. Everything that can go on is going on all round us. Religions buzz about us like bees. A serious sex worship, quite different from the cheery lechery endemic in our species, is one of them. Traces of embryonic religions occur in science fiction. Meanwhile, as always, the Christian way too is followed. But nowadays, when it is not followed, it need not be feigned. That fact covers a good deal of what is called the decay of religion. Apart from that, is the present so very different from other ages, or the West from anywhere else? 15. Before we can communicate I have been asked to write about the problem of communication, by which my inquirer meant communication under modern conditions between Christians and the outer world. And, as usually happens to me when I am questioned, I feel a little embarrassed by the simplicity and unexcitingness of the answer I want to give. I feel that what I have to say is on a cruder and lower level than was hoped for. My ideas about communication are purely empirical, and two anecdotes, both strictly true, will illustrate the sort of experience on which they are based. 1. The old prayer book prayed that magistrates might truly and indifferently administer justice. Then the revisers thought that they would make this easier by altering indifferently to impartially. A country clergyman of my acquaintance asked his sexton what he thought indifferently meant, and got the correct answer. It means making no difference between one chap and another. 
And what, continued the parson, do you think impartially means? Ah, said the sexton after a pause, I wouldn't know that. Everyone sees what the revisers had in mind. They were afraid that the man in the pew would take indifferently to mean, as it often does, carelessly, without concern. They knew that this error would not be made by highly educated people, but they thought it would be made by everyone else. The sexton's reply, however, reveals that it will not be made by the least educated class of all. It will be made only by those who are educationally in the middle, those whose language is fashionable, our elders would have said polite, without being scholarly. The highest and lower classes are both equally safe from it, and impartially, which guards the middle churchgoers from misunderstanding, is meaningless to the simple. 2. During the war I got into a discussion with a working man about the devil. He said he believed in a devil, but not a personal devil. As the discussion proceeded, it grew more and more perplexing to both parties. It became clear that we were somehow at cross-purposes. Then suddenly, and almost by accident, I discovered what was wrong. It became obvious that he had, all along, been meaning by the word personal, nothing more or less or other than corporeal. He was a very intelligent man, and once this discovery had been made, there was no difficulty. Apparently we had not really disagreed about anything. The difference between us was merely one of vocabulary. It set me wondering how many of the thousands of people who say they believe in God but not in a personal God are really trying to tell us no more than that they are not, in the strict sense, anthropomorphists, and are, in fact, asserting on this point their perfect orthodoxy. Where the revisers of the prayer book and I both went wrong was this. We both had a priori notions of what simple people mean by words. I assumed that the workman's usage was the same as my own. The revisers, more subtly but not more correctly, assumed that all would know the sense of indifferently, which they were guarding against when they amended it. But apparently we must not decide a priori what other people mean by English words any more than what Frenchmen mean by French words. We must be wholly empirical. We must listen and note and memorize. And, of course, we must set aside every trace of snobbery or pedantry about right or wrong usages. Now this is, I feel, very humdrum and workaday, when one wants to discuss the problem of communication on a grand philosophical level, when one wants to talk about conflicts of Weltanschauung and the predicament of modern or urban or crisis consciousness, it is chilling to be told that the first step is simply linguistic in the crudest sense. But it is. What we want to see in every ordination exam is a compulsory paper on simply translation, a passage from some theological work to be turned into plain vernacular English, just turned not adorned, nor diluted, nor made matey. The exercise is very like doing Latin prose. Instead of saying, how would Cicero have said that, you have to ask yourself, how would my scout or bedmaker have said that? You will at once find that this labour has two useful by-products. One, in the very process of eliminating from your matter all that is technical, learned, or elusive, you will discover, perhaps for the first time, the true value of learned language, namely brevity. It can say in ten words what popular speech can hardly get into a hundred. Your popularization of the passage set will have to be very much longer than the original, and this we must just put up with. Two, you will also discover at least I, a copious translator, think I have discovered just how much you yourself have, up to that moment, been understanding the language which you are now trying to translate. Again and again I have been most usefully humiliated in this way. One holds, or thinks one holds, a particular view, say, of the atonement or orders or inspiration, and you can go on for years discussing and defending it to others of your own sort. New refinements can be introduced to meet its critics. Brilliant metaphors can seem to illuminate its obscurities. Comparisons with other views, placings of it, are somehow felt to establish its position in a sort of aristocracy of ideas. For the others are all talking the same language, and all move in the same world of discourse. All seems well.
then turn and try to expand this same view to an intelligent mechanic or a sincerely inquisitive but superficially quite irreverent schoolboy. Some question of shattering crudity, it would never be asked in learned circles, will be shot at you. You are like a skilled swordsman transfixed by an opponent who wins just because he knows none of the first principles. The crude question turns out to be fatal. You have never, it now appears, really understood what you have so long maintained. You haven't really thought it out. Not to the end. Not to the absolute ruddy end. You must either give it up or else begin it all over again. If, given patience and ordinary skill, you cannot explain a thing to any sensible person whatever, provided he will listen, then you don't really understand it yourself. Here, too, it is very like doing Latin prose. The bits you can't get into Latin are usually the bits you haven't really grasped in the English. What we need to be particularly on our guard against are precisely the vogue words, the incantatory words of our own circle. For your generation they are perhaps engagement, commitment, over against, under judgment, existential, crisis, and confrontation. These are, of all expressions, the least likely to be intelligible to anyone divided from you by a school of thought, by a decade, by a social class. They are like a family language or a school slang, and our private language may delude ourselves as well as mystifying outsiders. Enchanted words seem so full of meaning, so illuminating, but we may be deceived. What we derive from them may sometimes be not so much a clear conception as a heartwarming sense of being at home and among our own sort. We understand one another often means we are in sympathy. Sympathy is a good thing. It may even be in some ways a better thing than intellectual understanding, but not the same thing. 16. Cross-examination the following is an interview with C.S. Lewis, held on the 7th of May, 1963, in Lewis's rooms in Magdalen College, Cambridge. The interviewer is Mr. Sherwood E. Wirt, of the Billy Graham Evangelistic Association, Limited. Mr. Wirt. Professor Lewis, if you had a young friend with some interest in writing on Christian subjects, how would you advise him to prepare himself? Lewis. I would say if a man is going to write on chemistry, he learns chemistry. The same is true of Christianity. But to speak of the craft itself, I would not know how to advise a man how to write. It is a matter of talent and interest. I believe he must be strongly moved if he is to become a writer. Writing is like a lust, or like scratching when you itch. Writing comes as a result of a very strong impulse, and when it does come, I for one must get it out. Mr. Wirt, can you suggest an approach that would spark the creation of a body of Christian literature strong enough to influence our generation? Lewis, there is no formula in these matters. I have no recipe, no tablets. Writers are trained in so many individual ways that it is not for us to prescribe. Scripture itself is not systematic. The New Testament shows the greatest variety. God has shown us that he can use any instrument. Balaam's ass, you remember, preached a very effective sermon in the midst of his he-haws. Mr. Wirt, a light touch has been characteristic of your writings, even when you are dealing with heavy theological themes. Would you say there is a key to the cultivation of such an attitude? Lewis, I believe this is a matter of temperament. However, I was helped in achieving this attitude by my studies of the literary men of the Middle Ages and by the writings of G. K. Chesterton. Chesterton, for example, was not afraid to combine serious Christian themes with buffoonery. In the same way, the miracle plays of the Middle Ages would deal with a sacred subject such as the Nativity of Christ, yet would combine it with a farce. Mr. Wirt, should Christian writers then, in your opinion, attempt to be funny? Lewis, no. I think that forced jocularities on spiritual subjects are an abomination and the attempts of some religious writers to be humorous are simply appalling. Some people write heavily, some write lightly. I prefer the light approach because I believe there is a great deal of false reverence about. There is too much solemnity and intensity in dealing with sacred matters, too much speaking in holy tones. Mr. Wirt, but is not solemnity proper and conducive to a sacred atmosphere? Lewis, 
yes and no. There is a difference between a private devotional life and a corporate one. Solemnity is proper in church, but things that are proper in church are not necessarily proper outside, and vice versa. For example, I can say a prayer while washing my teeth, but that does not mean I should wash my teeth in church. Mr. Wirt, what is your opinion of the kind of writing being done within the Christian church today? Lewis, a great deal of what is being published by writers in the religious tradition is a scandal and is actually turning people away from the church. The liberal writers who are continually accommodating and whittling down the truth of the gospel are responsible. I cannot understand how a man can appear in print claiming to disbelieve everything that he presupposes when he puts on the surplus. I feel it is a form of prostitution. Mr. Wirt, what do you think of the controversial new book Honest to God by John Robinson, the Bishop of Woolwich? Lewis, I prefer being honest to being honest to God. Mr. Wirt, what Christian writers have helped you? Lewis, the contemporary book that has helped me the most is Chesterton's The Everlasting Man. Others are Edwin Bevan's book Symbolism and Belief and Rudolf Otto's The Idea of the Holy and the plays of Dorothy Sayers. Mr. Wirt, I believe it was Chesterton who was asked why he became a member of the church and he replied, To get rid of my sins. Lewis, It is not enough to want to get rid of one's sins. We also need to believe in the one who saves us from our sins. Not only do we need to recognize that we are sinners, we need to believe in a Savior who takes away sin. Matthew Arnold once wrote, Nor does the being hungry prove that we have bread. Because we are sinners, it does not follow that we are saved. Mr. Wirt, in your book Surprised by Joy, you remark that you were brought into the faith kicking and struggling and resentful, with eyes darting in every direction looking for an escape. You suggest that you were compelled, as it were, to become a Christian. Do you feel that you made a decision at the time of your conversion? Lewis. I would not put it that way. What I wrote in Surprised by Joy was that, before God closed in on me, I was in fact offered what now appears a moment of wholly free choice. But I feel my decision was not so important. I was the object rather than the subject in this affair. I was decided upon. I was glad afterwards at the way it came out, but at the moment what I heard was God saying, Put down your gun and we'll talk. Mr. Wirt, that sounds to me as if you came to a very definite point of decision. Lewis, well, I would say that the most deeply compelled action is also the freest action. By that I mean, no part of you is outside the action. It is a paradox. I expressed it in surprised by joy by saying that I chose yet it really did not seem possible to do the opposite. Mr. Wirt, you wrote twenty years ago that a man who was merely a man and said the sort of things Jesus said would not be a great moral teacher. He would either be a lunatic, on a level with the man who says he is a poached egg, or else he would be the devil of hell. You must make your choice. Either this man was and is the Son of God, or else a madman or something worse. You can shut him up for a fool, you can spit at him and kill him as a demon, or you can fall at his feet and call him Lord and God. But let us not come with any patronizing nonsense about his being a great human teacher. He has not left that open to us. He did not intend to. Would you say your view of this matter has changed since then? Lewis, I would say there is no substantial change. Mr. Wirt, would you say that the aim of Christian writing, including your own writing, is to bring about an encounter of the reader with Jesus Christ? Lewis, that is not my language, yet it is the purpose I have in view. For example, I have just finished a book on prayer, an imaginary correspondence with someone who raises questions about difficulties in prayer. Mr. Wirt, how can we foster the encounter of people with Jesus Christ? Lewis, you can't lay down any pattern for God. There are many different ways of bringing people into his kingdom, even some ways that I especially dislike. I have therefore learned to be cautious in my judgment. But we can block it in many ways. As Christians, we are tempted to make unnecessary concessions to those outside the faith. We give in too much. 
Now, I don't mean that we should run the risk of making a nuisance of ourselves by witnessing at improper times, but there comes a time when we must show that we disagree. We must show our Christian colors if we are to be true to Jesus Christ. We cannot remain silent or concede everything away. There is a character in one of my children's stories named Aslan, who says, I never tell anyone any story except his own. I cannot speak for the way God deals with others. I only know how he deals with me personally. Of course, we are to pray for spiritual awakening, and in various ways we can do something toward it. But we must remember that neither Paul nor Apollos gives the increase. As Charles Williams once said, the altar must often be built in one place so that the fire may come down in another place. Mr. Wirt, Professor Lewis, your writings have an unusual quality not often found in discussions of Christian themes. You write as though you enjoyed it. Lewis, if I didn't enjoy writing, I wouldn't continue to do it. Of all my books, there was only one I did not take pleasure in writing. Mr. Wirt, which one? Lewis, the screw tape letters. They were dry and gritty going. At the time, I was thinking of objections to the Christian life and decided to put them into the form, that's what the devil would say. But making goods bad and bads good gets to be fatiguing. Mr. Wirt, how would you suggest a young Christian writer go about developing a style? Lewis, the way for a person to develop a style is, A, to know exactly what he wants to say, and B, to be sure he is saying exactly that. The reader, we must remember, does not start by knowing what we mean. If our words are ambiguous, our meaning will escape him. I sometimes think that writing is like driving sheep down a road. If there is any gate open to the left or the right, the readers will most certainly go into it. Mr. Wirt, do you believe that the Holy Spirit can speak to the world through Christian writers today? Lewis, I prefer to make no judgment concerning a writer's direct illumination by the Holy Spirit. I have no way of knowing whether what is written is from heaven or not. I do believe that God is the Father of lights, natural lights as well as spiritual lights, James 1, 1, verse 17. That is, God is not interested only in Christian writers as such. He is concerned with all kinds of writing. In the same way, a sacred calling is not limited to ecclesiastical functions. A man who is weeding a field of turnips is also serving God. Mr. Wirt An American writer, Mr. Dewey Beagle, has stated that in his opinion, the Isaac Watts hymn, When I Survey the Wondrous Cross, is more inspired by God than is the Song of Solomon in the Old Testament. What would be your view? Lois The great saints and mystics of the Church have felt just the opposite about it. They have found tremendous spiritual truths in the Song of Solomon. There is a difference of levels here. The question of the canon is involved. Also, we must remember that what is meat for a grown person might be unsuited to the palate of a child. Mr. Wirt, how would you evaluate modern literary trends as exemplified by such writers as Ernest Hemingway, Samuel Beckett, and Jean-Paul Sartre? Lewis, I have read very little in this field, I am not a contemporary scholar. I am not even a scholar of the past, but I am a lover of the past. Mr. Wirt, do you believe that the use of filth and obscenity is necessary in order to establish a realistic atmosphere in contemporary literature? Lewis, I do not. I treat this development as a symptom, a sign of a culture that has lost its faith. Moral collapse follows upon spiritual collapse. I look upon the immediate future with great apprehension. Mr. Wirt, do you feel, then, that modern culture is being de-Christianized? Lewis, I cannot speak to the political aspects of the question, but I have some definite views about the de-Christianizing of the Church. I believe that there are many accommodating preachers and too many practitioners in the Church who are not believers. Jesus Christ did not say, Go into all the world and tell the world that it is quite right. The gospel is something completely different. In fact, it is directly opposed to the world. The case against Christianity that is made out in the world is quite strong. Every war, every shipwreck, every cancer case, every calamity contributes to making a prima facie case against Christianity. 
It is not easy to be a believer in the face of this surface evidence. It calls for a strong faith in Jesus Christ. Mr. Wirt, do you approve of men such as Brian Greene and Billy Graham asking people to come to a point of decision regarding the Christian life? Lewis, I had the pleasure of meeting Billy Graham once. We had dinner together during his visit to Cambridge University in 1955 while he was conducting a mission to students. I thought he was a very modest and a very sensible man, and I liked him very much indeed. In a civilization like ours, I feel that everyone has to come to terms with the claims of Jesus Christ upon his life, or else be guilty of inattention or of evading the question. In the Soviet Union it is different. Many people living in Russia today have never had to consider the claims of Christ, because they have never heard of those claims. In the same way, we who live in English-speaking countries have never really been forced to consider the claims, let us say, of Hinduism. But in our Western civilization, we are obligated, both morally and intellectually, to come to grips with Jesus Christ. If we refuse to do so, we are guilty of being bad philosophers and bad thinkers. Mr. Wirt, what is your view of the daily discipline of the Christian life, the need for taking time to be alone with God? Lewis, we have our New Testament regimental orders upon the subject. I would take it for granted that everyone who becomes a Christian would undertake this practice. It is enjoined upon us by our Lord, and since they are His commands, I believe in following them. It is always just possible that Jesus Christ meant what He said when He told us to seek the secret place and to close the door. Mr. Wirt, what do you think is going to happen in the next few years of history, Mr. Lewis? Lewis, I have no way of knowing. My primary field is the past. I travel with my back to the engine, and that makes it difficult when you try to steer. The world might stop in ten minutes. Meanwhile, we are to go on doing our duty. The great thing is to be found at one's post as a child of God, living each day as though it were our last, but planning as though our world might last a hundred years. We have, of course, the assurance of the New Testament regarding events to come. I find it difficult to keep from laughing when I find people worrying about future destruction of some kind or other. Didn't they know they were going to die anyway? Apparently not. My wife once asked a young woman friend whether she had ever thought of death, and she replied, oh, By the time I reach that age, science will have done something about it. Mr. Wirt, do you think there will be widespread travel in space? Lewis, I look forward with horror to contact with the other inhabited planets, if there are such. We would only transport to them all of our sin and our acquisitiveness and establish a new colonialism. I can't bear to think of it. But if we on earth were to get right with God, of course all would be changed. Once we find ourselves spiritually awakened, we can go to outer space and take the good things with us. That is quite a different matter. Part 3 1. Bulverism, or the foundation of twentieth-century thought. It is a disastrous discovery, as Emerson says somewhere, that we exist. I mean, it is disastrous when, instead of merely attending to a rose, we are forced to think of ourselves looking at the rose, with a certain type of mind and a certain type of eyes. It is disastrous because, if you are not very careful, the colour of the rose gets attributed to our optic nerves and its scent to our noses, and in the end there is no rose left. The professional philosophers have been bothered about this universal blackout for over two hundred years, and the world has not much listened to them. But the same disaster is now occurring on a level we can all understand. We have recently discovered that we exist in two new senses. The Freudians have discovered that we exist as bundles of complexes. The Marxians have discovered that we exist as members of some economic class. In the old days, it was supposed that if a thing seemed obviously true to a hundred men, then it was probably true in fact. Nowadays, the Freudian will tell you to go and analyse the hundred, you will find that they all think Elizabeth I a great queen because they all have a mother complex. Their thoughts are psychologically tainted at the source. And the Marxist will tell you to go and examine the economic interests of the hundred. 
You will find that they all think freedom a good thing because they are all members of the bourgeoisie whose prosperity is increased by a policy of laissez-faire. Their thoughts are ideologically tainted at the source. Now, this is obviously great fun, but it has not always been noticed that there is a bill to pay for it. There are two questions that people who say this kind of thing ought to be asked. The first is, are all thoughts thus tainted at the source, or only some? The second is, does the taint invalidate the tainted thought in the sense of making it untrue or not? If they say all thoughts are thus tainted, then, of course, we must remind them that Freudianism and Marxism are as much system of thought as Christian theology or philosophical idealism. The Freudian and the Marxian are in the same boat with all the rest of us and cannot criticize us from outside. They have sawn off the branch they were sitting on. If, on the other hand, they say that the taint need not invalidate their thinking, then neither need it invalidate ours, in which case they have saved their own branch, but also saved ours along with it. The only line they can really take is to say that some thoughts are tainted and others are not, which has the advantage, if Freudians and Marxians regard it as an advantage, of being what every sane man has always believed. But if that is so, then we must ask how you find out which are tainted and which are not. It is no earthly use saying that those are tainted which agree with the secret wishes of the thinker. Some of the things I should like to believe must in fact be true. It is impossible to arrange a universe which contradicts everyone's wishes in every respect at every moment. Suppose I think, after doing my accounts, that I have a large balance at the bank. And suppose you want to find out whether this belief of mine is wishful thinking. You can never come to any conclusion by examining my psychological condition. Your only chance of finding out is to sit down and work through the sum yourself. When you have checked my figures, then, and then only, will you know whether I have that balance or not. If you find my arithmetic correct, then no amount of vaporing about my psychological condition can be anything but a waste of time. If you find my arithmetic wrong then it may be relevant to explain psychologically how I came to be so bad at my arithmetic, and the doctrine of the concealed wish will become relevant. But only after you have yourself done the sum and discovered me to be wrong on purely arithmetical grounds. It is the same with all thinking and all systems of thought. If you try to find out which are tainted by speculating about the wishes of the thinkers, you are merely making a fool of yourself. You must first find out, on purely logical grounds, which of them do, in fact, break down as arguments. Afterwards, if you like, go on and discover the psychological causes of the error. In other words, you must show that a man is wrong before you start explaining why he is wrong. The modern method is to assume without discussion that he is wrong, and then distract his attention from this, the only real issue, by busily explaining how he became so silly. In the course of the last fifteen years, I have found this vice so common that I have had to invent a name for it. I call it bulverism. Some day I am going to write the biography of its imaginary inventor, Ezekiel Bulver, whose destiny was determined at the age of five when he heard his mother say to his father, who had been maintaining that two sides of a triangle were together greater than the third, "'Oh, you say that because you are a man.' At that moment, E. Bulver assures us, there flashed across my opening mind the great truth that refutation is no necessary part of argument. Assume that your opponent is wrong, and then explain his error, and the world will be at your feet. Attempt to prove that he is wrong, or, worse still, try to find out whether he is wrong or right, and the national dynamism of our age will thrust you to the wall. That is how Bulver became one of the makers of the twentieth century. I find the fruits of his discovery almost everywhere. Thus I see my religion dismissed on the grounds that the comfortable parson had every reason for assuring the nineteenth-century worker that poverty would be rewarded in another world. Well, no doubt he had. On the assumption that Christianity is an error, I can see early enough that some people would still have a motive for inculcating it. I see it so easily that I can, of course, play the game the other way round, by saying that the modern man has every reason for trying to convince himself that there are no eternal sanctions behind the morality he is rejecting. For Bulverism is a truly democratic game, in the sense that all can play it all day long, 
and that it gives no unfair privilege to the small and offensive minority who reasoned. But of course it gets us not one inch nearer to deciding whether, as a matter of fact, the Christian religion is true or false. That question remains to be discussed on quite different grounds, a matter of philosophical and historical argument. However it were decided, the improper motives of some people, both for believing it and for disbelieving it, would remain just as they are. I see bulverism at work in every political argument. The capitalists must be bad, be bad, be bad economists because we know why they want capitalism. And equally, the communists must be bad economists because we know why they want communism. Thus, the bulverists on both sides. In reality, of course, either the doctrines of the capitalists are false, or the doctrines of the communists, or both. But you can only find out the rights and wrongs by reasoning, never by being rude about your opponent's psychology. Until bulverism is crushed, reason can play no effective part in human affairs. Each side snatches it early as a weapon against the other. But between the two, reason itself is discredited. And why should reason not be discredited? It would be easy, in answer, to point to the present state of the world. But the real answer is even more immediate. The forces discrediting reason themselves depend on reasoning. You must reason even to bulverize. You are trying to prove that all proofs are invalid. If you fail, you fail. If you succeed, then you fail even more, for the proof that all proofs are invalid must be invalid itself. The alternative, then, is either sheer self-contradicting idiocy, or else some tenacious belief in our power of reasoning held in the teeth of all the evidence that bulverists can bring for a taint in this or that human reasoner. I am ready to admit, if you like, that this tenacious belief has something transcendental or mystical about it. What then? Would you rather be a lunatic than a mystic? So we see there is justification for holding on to our belief in reason. But can this be done without theism? Does I know involve that God exists? Everything I know is an inference from sensation except the present moment. All our knowledge of the universe beyond our immediate experiences depends on inferences from these experiences. If our inferences do not give a genuine insight into reality, then we can know nothing. A theory cannot be accepted if it does not allow our thinking to be a genuine insight, nor if the fact of our knowledge is not explicable in terms of that theory. But our thoughts can only be accepted as a genuine insight under certain conditions. All beliefs have causes, but a distinction must be drawn between 1. ordinary causes and 2. a special kind of cause called a reason. Causes are mindless events which can produce other results than belief. Reasons arrive from axioms and inferences and affect only beliefs. Bulverism tries to show that the other man has causes and not reasons and that we have reasons and not causes. A belief which can be accounted for entirely in terms of causes is worthless. This principle must not be abandoned when we consider the beliefs which are the basis of others. Our knowledge depends on our certainty about axioms and inferences. If these are the result of causes, then there is no possibility of knowledge. Either we can know nothing, or thought has reasons only and no causes. The remainder of this essay, which was originally read to the Socratic Club before publication in the Socratic Digest, continues in the form of notes taken down by the secretary of the club. This explains why it is not all in the first person, as is the text proper. One might argue, Mr. Lewis continued, that reason had developed by natural selection, only those methods of thought which had proved useful surviving. 